Borak Thong Athletes and welcome to the 2080 Thriller Cast. Now, as I said last week, uh, we are still trying to process the news that Carlos Escala, uh, co-creator of Joe Dread, Strontium Dog, uh, artist on Stainless Steel Rat and so many thousands of comic book pages has passed away. The first thing we wanted to do was to pay tribute to him on the 2080 Thrillcast. So in this episode, we've talked to some of the people who knew him and worked with him, some of the people who've been influenced by him in later years, and just a fraction of both categories of people. Um, it's an opportunity to get people's take on Carlos's influence, his legacy, and what he was like as a person. For those of us who were fortunate enough to meet him, talk to him, then we'll be, I'm sure, all feeling uh, particularly stunned and still very, very upset that the master, King Carlos, is no longer with us. So hopefully this will be an opportunity for just a few people to talk about what Carlos and his work meant to them. If you have tributes of your own to give, then make sure you send them to us at thrillcast at 2080.com. Also, uh, tweet or Facebook us uh, at the 2080 accounts, and uh, we'll do our best to retweet and share as many of those as we possibly can. At the end of this episode, we're going to return to 2015, the dawn of the Thriller cast, where we had Carlos on to talk about the birth of Judge Dredd and his work for 2000 AD. In the meantime, we've got some chats with, as I said, those who worked with him, those who knew him, and those who were influenced by him. So let's talk a bit about Carlos uh, and his work and his legacy. Um, I welcome Matt Smith back into the studio, editor of 2018, somebody who's worked with Carlos for uh, almost 20 years now. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about your your relationship with Carlos. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it was always very, very friendly and fruitful. Um, I was a, a big, a big fan of his of his work as a as a reader when I when I you know, when I first started reading the in the prog back in 1985. Um, I think about a couple of a couple of issues after I started reading it, um, the Big Buster 49 started the Strontium mm. Dog story. Um, so I think that possibly may have been my first um, first um, introduction to Carlos's work. And his art's always always been a favourite of mine. It's also so you know powerful and clear and um, full of humour and um, and uh, just just so easy to easy to easy to read. Mm. Um, that uh, I always loved it. So we're good to you know um, to get the chance to to um, to work alongside him was um, was um, was lovely. And um, and he's and he was he was absolute absolute gent um and very very um very accommodating with deadlines he um i mean i've, I've you know I've, I've heard you know ever since you know he started work for 2000 how you know how quick he was you know he was doing episodes of the apocalypse war sort of in, in a week you know mm. um but um but he's you know he, when he when he uh when you when you need him so he can he can really pull out the stops and and deliver and deliver the pages so uh so he's very always uh always a great great uh great artist for that it, it, this isn't in any way to 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 uh, diminish his work because it was always fantastic but he he nonetheless had that um feel of being a journeyman he was he was uh he was a commercial artist he was somebody who was able to deliver to deadlines but the fact he was able to do it in this incredible style yeah uh and and you know consistency i mean you, you look across the last 40 odd years there's an incredible consistency to yeah, what he does yeah yeah i mean uh, i think i think that's part of the um the what makes strontium dogs so good as a body of work is is because he was he was pretty much the sole artist on it right through from the from the late 70s right through to the eight most of the 80s um and it is it is almost all of a piece it's so so consistent the artwork is is so solid um that i think i think that's that's part of part of strontium dog success is it's is it's um is it such a it feels like such a um strong strong uh universe that that, that, that him and him and john and alan alan uh created mm. um but um uh, but no i mean carlos is 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 was one of the one of the perfect artists for 2000 for 2000 editor in terms of 
uh, is amazingly good mm. and amazingly fast <laughs> and reliable. And that's, that's, well, that, 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 that's, that rare that's, Venn that's, diagram. That's, exactly. Thing, yeah. that's, that's that's what makes him. That's what made him one of the one of the top droids. In, mm. uh, he had all the elements that you 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 could want from a from an artist. Let's talk a, a little bit about his relationship, his working relationship with with John Wagner uh, and also Alan Grant as well, mm. because all three of them worked together for a very long time. What do you think was the the secret of the success of that partnership? Because you look at the different elements. You know, John's um, got a great sense of action, um, very terse, <laughs> mm. uh, almost monosyllabic sometimes in these scripts. Alan's got a lot of heart. Carlos has that grittiness, that uh, you know, that that dynamism. But it almost felt like, particularly things on uh, like on Frontium Dog, Apocalypse War, things like that. It's, it almost seems greater than the sum of its parts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think Carlos Carlos loved working with John and Alan. I think because they let him get on with it. Mm. They 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 knew that he he was good at creating characters. They they knew they could rely on him to um, to um, put ever what they wrote in the page yeah. in onto you know realize it into artwork. Um, so um, so I think they 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 worked well together because they knew, they they knew they could rely on each other. Um, and John and Alan are kind of similar as writers as Carlos was in that they they pretty much were you know were were pro, you know professional writers and they would they were they were working to deadlines mm. and considering the amount of work they were doing during the 80s when they were you know writing half the prog on robo hunter and dread and stront and um and doing stuff for scream and stuff for um, eagle as well um i mean alan has mentioned that Whatever they got paid, they got paid for the script they wrote. There were no royalties back then, so mm. they had to they had to they had to write a certain amount a week to get to get their paycheck. So they were writing they were writing to deadline, and they they weren't they weren't sort of you know um, faffing about. They were they were writing stories that that needed to be drawn, and um, and Carlos was Carlos you know kind of was um, was kind of a great artist for that. In the, the, here's a script, draw it, and he'll. He'll um he'll produce he'll produce the goods, mm. but at the same time produce goods that were that were full of imagination and and uh, and humour, um and um and played well to 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 the John's sort of the the sort of um sense of a sort of lone tough man that often turns up in his turns up in his stories you know mm. John, the Johnny Alpha the Dread or the the Harry Exton from Button Man, and um and played well with with Alan's um. Often, sort of comical, comical sidekicks that he would he would have in his stories. So, um, so yeah, they were they were good. They were a good match for um, all of them. Mm. He worked for most of his career for 2000 AD. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Um, I think he uh, I think he enjoyed the freedom mm. that 2000 AD gave him. Um, again, the editors left him alone um, to do to do his own thing. And didn't didn't ask him to produce multiple versions of the pencils or you know um, go back to to correct correct anything. Well, mm. very rarely, I should imagine. Um, so I think he I think he enjoyed I think he enjoyed that enjoyed that freedom. And um, he never he never really got along with the whole superhero genre because um, he drew a story that Cy Spurrier wrote for the magazine that I commissioned called the Adjudicators, which was a which was a superhero mm. pastiche. Um, but he, he said, I think he said to me in an email that, um, yeah, superheroes aren't really my thing, you know. I, you know, cause he, he drew some, he drew some, some episodes of the boys as well for, um, for Garth. Um, and yeah, he's, he's he, he'll draw it, but he, he it's, it's not, <laughs> but he it, wasn't, like it. It, it wasn't his, it wasn't his, it wasn't his passion. And yeah. he, he, he was never an artist that was, that was, you know, hungry to draw Wolverine or, or Spider-Man the way some artists are. Cause mm. they, they grew up, he just wasn't, wasn't everything, anything I don't think he ever grew up on or had any great affinity for, mm. but, um, but he loved, he loved the, um, he loved the, the, the sort of down and dirty sci-fi of, of 2000 AD that, that appealed to him, I think. One of the things that, that, immediately sprang to mind when um, I heard the news uh, uh, when I was over in New York was uh, about the emails years ago before I started work at 2000 AD went to Spain to interview him for the magazine yeah. and uh, came back realised there was a bunch of stuff I hadn't asked about hurriedly emailing him while receiving emails from you going the deadline is tomorrow please can I have this feature and uh, I think it was the, the last of the three features I did and 
I was starting to panic. Didn't hear anything back from him. Thought, oh my God, I've I've offended him in some way. And I think about three days later, I got an email from him saying, hi, Mike, I'm sorry I've not replied to your uh, email. I'll, I'll get the answers to you this weekend. Uh, I'm in intensive care. I've had a lung out. Uh, yeah. And sure enough, on Saturday morning, those answers popped into my uh, uh, in, in, inbox. And, you know, there was no f- no further mention made of uh, his slight difficulty. Yeah. What, what, what are the kind of stories about dealing with Carlos that popped into your mind? Um, well, it's, it's, I mean, it was the, it's kind of the, the sense that the feeling that you're never going to, you're, you're never going to see a, a new, a new Strontium dog story mm. from his, you know, uh, from his pen again is kind of what, 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 what sort of struck me is, 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 is how much he was a, it was a fixture of 2000 AD, but also every time a, one of his stories was in 2000 AD, it, it kind of, you know, you, you know, it felt like a, a good solid prog. You know, mm. like he's, uh, you know, he, I always said that you know a, a, a Carlos Dread or a Carlos Strontium dog um, gave the, gave two thousand a bit of class. You know, as a bit <laughs> have sort of elevated the thrill power a little bit more. You know, because and um, and it, it yeah, the, the idea that we're not gonna we're not gonna have that again is is is, is heartbreaking. Um, but uh, it, it's yeah. I always, I mean, I always, one of the great things about being at a two thousand AD is, is when you is when you get when, when you get the artwork through and you get to see it for the first time. And with with Carlos, that was that was doubly so because you know you being such a fan of his artwork, and then you you become like the first person based in the UK to see this artwork. You know, you don't you don't realize that actually. Yeah, you're you know you're you're the first one beyond him that's mm. actually you know getting to getting first first glimpse of it so whenever you whenever you know an email from him or a, you know a, a link to a um to a file site where he's, he's uploaded the pages um there's always yeah always open them with a great sense of excitement see what he's see see what he's done mm. and uh and yeah in the in the in the in when i first started 2000 ad he used to um he used to post over his cds um by uh by some sort of version version of DHL or whatever, and um, and you'd open up the little plastic plastic pack that the uh, the CDs came in, and you get a waft of cigar smoke would come <laughs> was come out with it. So you kind of lost that a bit when you were just doing everything purely by email. Yeah. Um, but uh, but no, they 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 always um, always 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 greeted them with a great sense of excitement. Mm. You've already spoken a, a little bit about what we've lost, which mm. is you know. Never again will there be new Carlos Escalo artwork uh, in 2000 AD. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what we gained by having him in 2000 AD for all of those years, that, that incredible body of work. Do you think 2000 AD... Because I, I mentioned in, in one of the other uh, chats for this episode that you know he walked away from Judge Dredd um, before it even really had a chance to, to to get going because you know that first episode wasn't wasn't his he then made a choice to return for the apocalypse war yeah. do you think 2000 AD would be the same do you think it would still be here if he hadn't made that decision to return um I've, um well i mean i i um i possibly it would possibly still be here i i think I think he he added greatly to its um, to its sense of identity and its character um, by 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 around the about 1982 when the Apocalypse War started, 2000 E was really beginning to uh, enter its golden period, mm. you know, and it was really becoming more than just like a another um, sci-fi comic on the shelves amongst all the other um newsstand titles but it would had it had its own following and it, you know it was getting you know sort of celebrity fans and it was mm-hmm. and it was it was growing to a point where you know sort of forbidden planet was was growing around it you know it was it was it it was becoming becoming more than just a cult and um and i think i think carlos carlos's artwork certainly contributed enormously to that i think i think during that that those those years from sort of like you know 80 82 through to sort of 87 maybe it was when 2000 e absolutely was at its at its peak mm. and i think i think that carlos amongst the amongst the line of amongst the lineup of you know say kevin o'neill on um nemesis and 
Ian Gibson on Robo Hunter and um You got Cam Kennedy on Cam Kennedy on, Rogue on, on Rogue Trooper yeah. and then maybe Brett Ewins or Brian Volland on, on Dread. Um it really it really gave it a, a, a strong a strong identity. Mm. And uh I think uh I think he was he was an absolutely pivotal artist in, mm. in that. It was pleasing in later years to see him come over to the UK so often um, for convention appearances, particularly with John. And we had him at the 40th anniversary uh, yeah. show last year where that line was the longest. Yeah. <laughs> and my God, I don't think I've any, I haven't seen anybody sketch so <laughs> much and so quickly. Yeah. And yet, you know, I, I think we were getting towards the end of the day and I got asked to go over and just ask him if he could hurry up. And I was like, I don't particularly want to do that, but I will. Um, so I went over and he said, he just went, uh, it will take as long as it takes. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. going as fast as I can. I think he said, I'm an old man, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, I mean, he was, he was incredibly, incredibly self-deprecating for, for um, about his talent and um, um, enormously, enormously loved by, by a big, you know, comics reading mm. um, audience. Um, so uh, yeah, he's he's he he's always always had time for for you know for the fans for for people you know he'd quite happily you know sketch and draw and mm. um, and uh, and do and you know do do what what you what you, uh, what you asked of him. Um, but yeah, never any never any sense of you know of of, a, of an ego from him at all or mm. anything. He was he was you know purely purely doing it he loved because he loved doing it mm. and uh, and, he, and he and he acknowledged the fact that how much people enjoyed enjoyed his stuff. We're going to be paying tribute to him in various ways. Um, we've already had uh, a, a obituary in 2000 AD, yeah, and then there's uh, the obituary in the magazine as well. Yeah. Um, what else are we doing to to honour his memory at 2000 AD? Um, well, the the November magazine, which will have the uh, shall have a, have a longer um, obituary, which will. Um, Carl, Carl Stock is writing, and he's, he's gathering quotes from from uh, John Wagner and uh, Garth Ennis and and um, various other people who work works alongside him. Um, the 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 bagged um, reprint supplement will be will be a, a Carlos special, so mm. they'll be you know, pick various stories from throughout his various uh, career of mm -hmm. Dread and Stront and Tharg stories and things like that. Um, so we're we'll doing that. And then um, next year, um, the summer special is going to be a um, another Carlos tribute issue, uh, and that will reprint the um, two episodes of the creator own series that he was doing with John called Spectre, mm. which was a um, a robot police detective series that was going originally going to run in the magazine. Um, John wrote. The first four episodes and Carlos completed the first two, um, so we're going to run. I'm going to get those lettered up, and then we'll run. We'll run the two completed episodes and possibly run the the parts three and four of the script that John wrote. Just because I think the fans will be interested in seeing this last project that John and Carlos were working mm. on. Because um, I mean that that's a real shame because that was their first new character in in years. Yeah, wasn't it's it? the first 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 new characters they created together since Elle's baby mm. back in back in the beginning of the 90s so um so yeah so this was this would have been yeah this would have been um quite a you know quite a sort of milestone for the, for them um but um but yeah so that that will that will be kind of like the centerpiece of the of the summer special these this uh these these episodes from this story and then um the stories around it will probably be um Carlos creations with our last other Rise and artists, they want to want to do stories based mm. around those. Okay. Um, so yeah, and uh, um, the the and then we'll, we'll we'll the issue will be a, that will be available from the web shop. Will um, have the proceeds going to cancer charity. And in terms of what we now do, going into the future, um, uh, Carlosless, mm. um, have you? Paid any thought? Is it too soon to think about what we're doing with characters for which he was so well known? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, dread will continue as dread dread always does. Mm. Um, uh, I I can't see there being 
any more strontium dog. Mm -hmm. um, it, was always, it was always, I mean, pretty much, the, well, certainly the, the, the post-resurrection stories and, um, was always pretty much John and Carl's his mm. baby. And, um, I'm, I'm not sure John will be interested in writing anymore without Carlos. Um, that may that may change. He may he may he may feel he wants to do another story and another. He might have an idea for another artist to do it. But I I certainly won't push on it mm. to bring to bring you know Strontian Dog back because I think it's um, I think it's it's so um, synonymous with a with a particular artist that it feels uh, it feels um, unnecessary to um, to do it unless the creators are fully behind it. Mm. Um, and um, um, yeah, beyond that. Um, no, I don't think there are the, the there are any other plans for any of all these characters will be will be um be, be reused, I don't think. Mm. Um so um yeah, no, it's this will you know, we'll, I mean I think the two thousand is as as an entity will continue to to honour his legacy, I think. Mm. Um, he's he was such a big part of it. One of the people who worked with Carlos in his later years was Garth Ennis, who was a writer on lots of uh, World War II comics series. Uh, he had some wonderfully warm and uh, very interesting words to say about uh, not just his relationship with Carlos in terms of his work, but also his influence on him and uh, in comics in general. I had a chat with Garth at New York Comic Con. Do you want to uh, tell me a little bit about your your kind of your first exposure to Carlos's artwork and, and your reaction to it? Because I notice you you have a rather glorious pocket war page <laughs> yeah, on your wall. Yeah, um, so it would have been in two thousand AD. It would have been it would have been on Dread. Um, he did those first couple of episodes. Uh, the one with the gorilla. Yeah, the only kind of King Kong robot. He mm. did the one uh, where Dread actually has to fight. Call me Kenneth in his initial guy. So that it would have been there. Yeah, um, and I suppose it was love at first sight, as it was with so many of those guys. Um, then he disappears for a while. Then I saw him on Strand and Star Lord. Followed him into two thousand AD on that, and he was. He, he was a kind of a presence in battle. He did a lot of covers in battle, featuring uh, mostly featuring Rat Pack yeah. and similar. But he was he was always good for uh, one of those sort of action-packed war covers. You know, someone firing a stand gun, throwing a grenade, yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and uh, then I suppose eventually, after many years on Strong, back on Dread. And you see the apocalypse war mm. and you're just blown away i wonder i do wonder if he balked at all uh realizing that he'd come back to dread to destroy half of mega city one tear yeah. his own creation to pieces yeah. reveal dread as uh well a, a much more dangerous piece of work than than we'd be led to believe mm. um not just the the whole genocidal <laughs> business at the end but but things like uh shooting irradiated refugees as a as a mercy killing of mm. sorts uh gunning down collaborators it, there's no sense that he had any trouble with it it looked like he just did the job as usual um that was that was one of his great strengths i think mm. um whatever was thrown at him he just picked it up and ran with it what what, what do you think is is uh, the essence of Carlos's artwork. What do you think it, it brings to the table? The sheer scale of it. Mm. I mean, that's that's the funny thing. We're talking about this lovely little bloke who drew giants and titans and myths and legends. His his artwork is enormous. It's so much larger than life. His characters are are, are gigantic. There's so much scope to them. I remember once quite early on, he, he showed me a sketchbook um, and it was filled with character designs that had no home. And he said, if you want to pick one of those, um, we could maybe do something, which is very flattering. But I took a look through it and it was just one amazing looking character after another. The kind of things that most artists just wouldn't dare try. <laughs> that he made look so easy. Um, I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear that there was a good deal of um, 
uh, kind of medieval Catholic imagery with terrifying looking monks and nuns sure. and uh, crusader knights and so on. Um, I'm sure, in fact, I have seen some of them show up in Strand and Dread over the years. And uh, the one I picked became a series we did called Bloody Mary. Mm. Everyone likes a good nun, <laughs> nun with a gun. Um, but seeing those and seeing him able to do probably sketchbook after sketchbook where every page had an iconic character design on it that again things most people wouldn't have the nerve to try yeah um yes yeah, scope i think that's what he brought to the table because he was combined with uh, as, as you say he was, he was this little man doing these incredible designs but he was so unassuming mm. you know there was, there was never a hint of arrogance yeah despite everything that he'd done yeah yeah, it, it was a great pleasure to be able to uh, write a war story for him that was actually set in his own country. He, he'd never, as far as I know, been able to draw a story uh, that involved the, the defining conflict of his country for the 20th century, mm -hmm. the Spanish Civil War. I don't even know if he ever got to draw a, a story set in Spain at all. Um, but I can, I can remember thinking, you know, my goodness, you've never done anything like this before you've never even asked mm. um uh, but i think he got a he did a wonderful job on it it's it's called condors uh he did a terrific job as you would expect him to do um i think he did pull out all the stops for that one but um yes it, it's funny you know as, as you say unassuming um and yet able to pull this incredible imagery out of his head mm. uh I know he was in the army um, under Franco, it would have been, and I suppose it would have been the, the equivalent of national service or yeah. the draft, but I do sometimes wonder if maybe there was some terrifying drill sergeant, like, you know, Senior Sergeant Ramirez who terrorizes poor Private Escara, and, and maybe the guy had this big chin, and maybe every time Carlos was drawing one of these monstrous hard men or creating one of these icons, that drifted into his head. <laughs> uh, is, is there a definitive moment where you can point to something and say, that is Carl Scarrell, or is it a case of where he was just so consistent over 40-odd yeah. years? Yeah, the, the, there's too much for there to be a definitive moment. Yeah. There's really too much. I mean, uh, he was half of Dread, so Dread's just been torn in half, which is a strange thing to think about. And there's Strontium Dog and there's Fiends. There's so many moments throughout them there's Rat Pack and Major Easy for battle um, I mean my, my favourites would be the Apocalypse War um, mainly the grim moments we talked about earlier with the uh, the gunning down of the collaborators and the um, the uh, quite startling bit at the end where he dread kills half a billion people um, Strontium Dog my favourite there is the Moses incident that odd little story where Johnny takes a a little boy whose death he's accidentally caused to a kind of a haunted demon planet run by the evil magician Malik Brood and he and Wolf end up fighting uh, zombies in an alien churchyard just some incredible imagery there when I think about the stuff that Carlos and I did together and it was a real treat getting to work with him always um, there's the tankies where he created this wonderful little uh, semi-psychotic Geordie tank commander for me called Styles, who's one of those knobbly faced little grotesques Carlos was so good at um, there was Condors uh, for the reasons I, I mentioned um, he took over Kev from Glenn Fabry and did a great job on that, he nailed that perfectly because the humour in the story was very well suited to, to his kind of characters um and beyond that, Pilgrim, Bloody Mary, all those things. But yes, it's it's not surprising, of course, that my, my favorite work that I did with Carlos was the military stuff mm -hmm. or the war stories. And of course, Rifle Brigade, and I think only he could have done something like Rifle Brigade, where you need to understand a war story and the kind of archetypes you'll see in one well enough uh, so that you can make fun of them. Mm -hmm. And few people other than Carlos could have done that. Um, what was your relationship when you were working with him like? 
because uh, you're, commu- you're communicating a uh, lot, communicating by email. Mm. Um, uh, was was it a straightforward? Because I, I remember very vividly when I went to Spain to interview him. I mean, this was years ago now. Mm. Uh, I, you were working with him then, and uh, he said, "Well, thank God for Google." Yes, for some of the things Garth asked me to draw. <laughs> to draw. Yeah. Um, it's funny too because many of the things I asked him to draw he'd already drawn 20 or 30 <laughs> years earlier for battle um, but yes there's no doubt about it my relationship with him professionally was uh, similar to the ones I've enjoyed with with the best guys I've worked with um, we just trusted each other to get on with it I remember him once telling me that he liked my scripts because they were so straightforward and simple and of course the reason for that is they're based on John Wagner's mm that's where I learned to do it. And I think Carlos must have picked up on that. Um, So it was, it was the kind of simplicity I like, you know, two guys just trusting each other to do the job. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is legacy? Not just, uh, you know, there's thousands and thousands of of, of comic book pages, one of the most Mm -hmm. prolific artists in 2018 the comics has ever had. What do you think is, is, enduring legacy will be I think he he simply stamped his mark on 2000 AD in a way that few others actually have he created uh, some of the most iconic designs uh, designs that people haven't been able to better or improve upon Um, definitive imagery Mm. really Um, and just the fact that he's the co-creator of at least two of the 2000 AD all-time greats. Yeah. I mean, if you were to pick a, a top five or a top ten, Dread and Strong would have to be in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think one of the things that many people don't necessarily understand about Carlos is just how much you know we talked about maybe you know maybe you've been in the army um, mm. and was drawing on that there's so much of the uh, iconography the imagery that he drew on was surrounding him mm-hmm. you know he grew up he lived in a fascist dictatorship yes he did um, yes he did that, that uh, do you think that lends a certain degree of truth to the way that he designed things and the way he portrayed people i don't know about truth but I know that it must have been enormously helpful mm. for him when designing a character like Dread. It, it's interesting too that uh, John Wagner's reaction when he first sees the design is he looks like a pirate, you know, because he's got the <laughs> eagle on his shoulder. But of course, that would mean something completely different to Carlos. Carlos mm. would have been surrounded by that kind of imagery. Mm. Um, that would make a massive difference. Yeah, I mean, it, growing up, in what was essentially a fascist state and I think Carlos was born in 47 47 so by that stage fascist Spain would have been seven or eight years old mm. so he wouldn't have known it any other way yes that would have been uh, deeply imbued mm. I'm sure but there's, there's uh, I always felt uh, and we've kind of touched on this already but I always felt that there was um, the way he portrayed character the way he brought out uh, emotion in his mm. storytelling, even when dealing with somebody as grim as Dread, mm-hmm. somebody as, as stoic as Johnny Alpha, mm-hmm. an incredible amount of power. Uh, it, 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 say, for example, in, in um, uh, Rage, mm. um, uh, or any uh, d- d- sort of any story, mm-hmm. you had an incredible amount of emotion. You could just feel characters like Alpha just kind of clenched up and full of emotion it, it yes. seems to, that, that seems to be one of his incredible storytelling strengths yes it, it's interesting when you look at um, some of the dread material and you see how other people other judges are reacting around dread as he stays stoic and unflappable um, and Carlos manages to bring all that out mm. um, th- there's one that pops into my head uh, very early on in the apocalypse war dread either dread or the chief judge uh ask for a damage estimate on the soviet strikes Mm. that have been coming in and this tech judge turns around from his panel and goes 
total. And he looks like he's ready to have a nervous breakdown. Like yeah. he really is on the on the very edge where his dread and the chief judge just keep steadily cruising through all this, knowing knowing the course they're on. But yeah, look look at some of the minor characters that he pops into a strip. They all have personality. Mm. All of them. Even the most incidental. So one of the people who worked very closely with Carlos back in the early days of 2000 AD was editor Kelvin Gosnell, who wasn't just Carlos's editor, but was also his co-creator of the adaptation of Harry Harrison's Stainless Steel Rats. They worked together for many years, and uh, it's great to, to be able to talk to Kelvin uh, now on the line to get some of his recollections of working with Carlos. Kelvin, what's your earliest memory of Carlos? Earliest memory. Um, I think him coming in um, with uh, the samples for Judge Dredd that uh, John had scripted, mm. and um, being knocked knocked away by the whole thing. You know, because it was just so good. It was a different, a different way of looking at things. Um, at um, it was just so exciting. Because both uh, Pat Mills and John Wagner have, have referenced this this moment where uh, they see uh, Carlos's designs for the first time, and for John, there's that very famous line: uh, "Oh, he looks like a fucking Spanish pirate." Um, and uh, Pat has talked about how all of a sudden his his uh, as you say his vision of the strip changed. You know, it went from being a relatively near future kind of death race um, uh, uh, style strip to, to being a, 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 a more futuristic, a more sci-fi um, uh, story. Um, if I can interrupt you there. By all means. That is exactly what the whole working with Carlos was all about. Mm. In that, um, I've said before, he was... It, <sighs> It sounds a terrible description. It sounds too calculated. But he was an editor's artist, mm. editor and writer's artist, in that you sent him your ideas, your stories, and he gave them back to you exactly as you'd asked for them. But there was always that piece of improvement, that little bit of verve, that slightly different angle, which made it much more special. So that obviously is what John and Pat were talking about, the idea went out of futuristic cop, but came back as something much, much more, mm. with much more potential and much more, much more. It's a sexier idea when it came back. Because mm. Carlos had been working for some time by that point on British comics. He'd been, he'd, he'd worked on uh, romance comics. He'd worked on war comics. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd been a great success at uh, battle. Um, was he an obvious choice for something like Judge Dredd at the time? Hmm, that's a very difficult question. I guess, with the benefit of hindsight, um, which we all know is twenty twenty vision, the answer is yes. Mm. Um, but perhaps at the time, not quite so much. Um, but I think, again, to go back to what I just said about his ability to do something different, something with more style and more energy in it than you thought you could ever have, then yes, he was a natural choice mm. for the part although it might not have seemed so at the time but there again at that time with 2000 AD all the cards are in the air um, and let's see what comes down when you throw them up mm, mm. Now, of course he, he, he very famously walked away from Judge Dredd in, uh, at the very early days because he, he, he disliked the fact that um, the first episode was not one that, that, that he drew but I guess at, at the time uh, what was uh, 2080's loss was Battle's Game because of course he went off and, and worked on El Mestizo uh, uh, f f for them and then came back for the for the Apocalypse War. D do, you th do you think Carlos's absence allowed the character to grow in a different way that it, it might not have done if, he, if he'd been around? Again, a difficult question. Mm. No, I don't think so. I think once he had drawn that initial set uh, which was pulled because of um, ethical stroke moral problems with the actual events in the story. Once he had drawn that, I think the essential nature, the essential character of Judge Dredd was established. The other 
right uh, artists who picked it up later, like Mick McMahon, were basing what they were doing very much on what Carlos had done. Mm. So I think Carlos is the um, the author, in quotes, of the character from the visual point of view. Mm. Let's move on to, to your work with him on uh, Stainless Steel Rat. I mean, we, when I came down to interview you a, a while back, we, 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 we talked about Carlos's work on the strip. What's your overriding memory of, of your relationship with Carlos at that time? Um, well, just first of all, my absolute delight that um, he wanted to do it. Mm. There was no... He, what the serialization of the rat was something that I particularly wanted to do because I'm such a mad keen fan of good old Slippery Jim as uh, written by Harry Harrison um, and to discover that um, somehow Carlos got wind of the fact that we were doing it um, and we may have offered it to him I can't actually remember it's such a long time ago but when Carlos heard about it um, he was he was you know he was it was it was a case of who do I have to kill to draw this story? Mm. He was a fantastic stainless steel rat fan, so I was absolutely delighted because um, I thought he was a natural for the part. I'd always um, seen um, Jim DeGriz as looking a bit like um, uh, James Coburn, anyway, um, which I knew that that was part of Carlos's style was to draw characters that looked a bit like that. Um, and um, so I was very, very happy that um, he was going to do it. Mm. I, I, I will ask you kind of the same question as I, I, I did about Judge Dredd. You know, what what did he bring to uh, the strip that perhaps others might not have? Um, he brought a sort of fluidity. Of, um, he picked up the pace of the rat. Mm. The rat is a classic um, cop adventure story. It's all action with cliffhangers and all the rest of it. And he got that pace and speed of character and also the definition of character. That's why he would, in any story, whether it was El Mestizo or Judge Dredd or Strandium Dog or whoever, he got the essence of the character in the face, in the poses, in the postures, everything. For example, um, you don't meet um, De Grizz's wife, uh, Angelina, until about half, two-thirds of the way through the first story. Um, and I had a very fixed idea of what she'd looked like. And when I saw Carlos's artwork when it came back, it was perfect. You know, the, 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 her figure, her face, how tall she was, the expressions, absolutely spot on. Mm. He would always get their characters perfectly. And... Uh, in terms of uh, knowing him socially, knowing uh, you know not not just the talent, not just the person you were working with, but but Carlos as a, as a person, what what was he like at the time? Um, he was a very very nice bloke. Mm. Um, There's no other simple way of putting it. He, he was just really lovely to know, um, and of course his sense of humour um, was uh, was well known. One uh, incident pops to mind um, about. I forget which story it was. It might have been a relatively early Strontium Dog where um, we said the scene description called for a scene in a futuristic bar, which Carlos drew perfectly, including the three-breasted girl standing on one side of the bar serving drinks, um, which, of course, good gag. Hmm. We couldn't use it um, because... Uh, obviously, you can't have a bare-breasted girl in a kid's story. And I remember Kevin O'Neill being deeply amused, having to draw in a bra <laughs> on the front of each of the breasts. <laughs> but that was the sort of guy he was. You know, you, you had to have a joke with Carlos. Um, and he was just great to work with. Mm -hmm. And without going into too much detail, uh, what was your reaction when you heard the news about him? I was absolutely stunned and mm. um, I, I, I couldn't speak for quite a while because I was just just so sad um, I know it's decades since I worked with the guy but it is the nature of this business working as um, writer to artist that no matter how long between you actually seeing them and the present day that closeness of relationship persists and it was it, you know, he was a good friend when I was working with him. I, even though I hadn't seen him for decades, I still regarded him as a good mate, and I was very, very sad to hear that he'd died. Mm. 
So what, what do you think is his contribution to comic books as not just a, an industry, but as a medium itself? I think that this is the most important thing with Carlos, which is often overlooked um, because of the nature of the business, the nature of the medium. It, it, and that Carlos has often been said to be the definitive 2000 AD artist in that, as I've said, he would always do something new. That he would put some, uh, his own personality and and edge and verve into it. And he did this with his work on 2000 AD, be it Strontium Dog or Dread or, or The Rat. But I think it goes beyond that. I think that Carlos did more for the medium, for the art of the picture strip artist across the board, internationally as well. I think other countries' stories and styles have changed because of what Carlos did. And what he basically did was he rewrote the book on, no, let's say he didn't rewrite the book, he redrew <laughs> the book for picture strip stories. And that was just such a fantastic achievement. He will be very sadly missed. Some more people that I caught up with at New York Comic Con uh, not long after hearing the sad news about Carlos were writer Rob Williams, artist PJ Holden and writer David Bailey who gave their take on Carlos and his legacy. PJ Holden, uh, what would you say was the influence that Carlos had on you as an artist, as when an I artist. when I was very very young, I couldn't. There was there was art you you'd look at and you could understand and you could sort of figure out how to replicate. And then you'd look at Carlos's art, you'd think, I think I know how to do that. And and that what people I think called sometimes the Mars bar ink and that sort of thick and and I just couldn't understand. I couldn't wrap my head around what he was doing. And it seemed like magic to me. It it was it was both very defining and allowed characters to pop but at the same time didn't look like a cardboard cutout it, it was the first time i think i saw inking that was organic and um both designery but also part of the art it was part of the the, the kind of the structure of the art you know and, and so um kind of seeing that and kind of going i don't know how to do that it, it, it was just it was like alchemy it was something i, I couldn't quite figure out but then also i think um just seeing the Apocalypse War, when the Apocalypse War started and having, having that run of stuff, Block Mania and so on, all that stuff beforehand, and then that constant run of incredible quality. And as, as uh, you know, coming, coming into 2080 as an artist and looking at artwork like Carlos is just thinking, how, how can you be that consistently good for that length of time? You know, it's just, it's an admirable, and I, you know, I don't even know now if there's anyone could be just that consistent over that length of time. I mean, you look at the uh, the Stunting Dog serials that he did, you know, think, uh, things like Ragnarok, yeah. uh, things like Rage. These went on for months yeah. and months and months. And, uh, you know, I, I discovered them in the best of 2018 monthly. Yeah. And there is no appreciable dip. No. In quality no. at all, or, or change in style. So, so many artists, and this isn't necessarily casting any aspersions on anybody, but over the course of a project, artists tend to get faster, yeah. mainly because they're coming up against deadlines. But, um, uh, and the because. Backgrounds disappear. Yeah. And yeah. That, and, that never and, happened with him. And, and, and people, yeah, people kind of. Um, yeah, or, yeah, they learn how to just cut corners. Carlos's, but it's Carlos's, the same. Carlos's work, it looked. This is maybe the wrong phrase, but it looked labour intensive, yet it never looked laboured. Mm. It always looked like, wow, that's a lot of time has been spent doing this. But at the same time, it never felt like it was that is someone who isn't enjoying what they're doing. You know, that is someone who's, uh, you know, it, it just, it's just so incredibly consistent uh, all the time and so well put together and so beautifully designed. Um, not just not just in terms of oh, the characters are great, great such great design sensibility in the characters and the buildings and the things, but also the page and the panel shapes and I think like he's the only artist even now I still think of. If I think of rounded corners and panel borders, it's Carlos's rounded panel borders, and I I kind of will sometimes go I should try that I should I should give a go with that. That's a thing. I, that's a technique. And then you think, I can't do that. <laughs> I could never get away with that. Carlos could do that because yeah. he's Carlos. So you couldn't, you know, you, you can't come near him at all. I, did, I mean, I don't know. I, I suppose it's an honor, but I, I, I followed him on a, on a World of Tanks book where Carlos had to 
at a stop. Um, he did two issues of it, and I did three. And it was kind of the time was like, wow, Carlos is how come Carlos has never missed a deadline? How is this possible? And it and it, uh, his mum hadn't been well, and I I got to chat to him at the fortieth anniversary. I said, is your mum okay? Ah, she's fine. <laughs> You know, he's such a lovely guy, so so funny, and but like to to, it just it seemed incon inconceivable that he would even be late for a book, you know, let alone that he's not here anymore. That's that's kind of that to, to think of 2080 without him. It's just it's it's hard to it's hard to picture that. You know? Well, I mean, I remember his first. Uh operation that he had back in 2010 for, for lung cancer and he was back growing within oh, yeah, yeah. two weeks <laughs> he's an incredible he was an incredible guy just I mean and the brief time that I, I met him you know he just he seemed so warm and, and engaging and funny and you know and, and he always looked incredibly healthy even 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 with hospital pictures with cancer he looked healthier than I ever feel he That's, looked like he was working out in that photograph yeah, he, he was yeah. big and healthy yeah yeah, uh, 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 David Bailey. Uh, this episode is going to be full of people who have their own personal experiences of, of Carlos and his and his work. What, what, what's your earliest memory of it? My my earliest memory is like you you mentioned before. Uh, there was a, a best of 2000 AD that I was bought to keep me quiet in the car, and it was a Strontium Dog uh, reprint. And I don't know what the story is called, but uh, there's there's a scene where the there's slavers and they're force feeding a bunch of people and there's like bits of food all over yeah, their face yeah. and I just remember pouring over that page for honestly hours looking at all the texture I just it, it seemed it seemed real in a way that reality couldn't even match it was like there was so much going on um, and like PJ said you try to recreate it yourself because I used to draw at the time and you know I, I spent hours copying panels and copying panels and it was it was heartbreaking to realise that I was never going to do that but less heartbreaking when you realise that hardly anyone is, 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 is good enough to match Carlos yeah. Esquero on, on, on the page but uh, talking about Mars barring is that what you're calling the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the uh, round the outline um, friend uh, Leon Hewitt who used to write for the magazine I think asked him once what what that was about and Carlos said well it makes uh, it adds motion to the picture it makes yeah. makes the character seem like they're moving even though it's a static image mm -hmm. and Leon thought about it for a second and Carlos leaned in and said don't you agree? Yeah. And it was like something just you really fervently believed that. Yeah. And when you think about that, it, it, it does it. It yeah. kind of makes it makes the, the lead image vibrate, well, especially in a cover. Yeah, it does, it was, it does. It was and great. I think as well that that kind of that sort of staccato outline around mm. the thing. If if it was a single thick line like that, it would just kill. It would just kill it. Yeah, dead. Oh, totally, it would totally, be totally. so flat. Yeah. But if it was a really thin outline, it wouldn't pop no. the way it does. And even so that, if it was that a, va sort of a very brush line, wouldn't yeah. have the same effect. Yeah. At all. So the genius of that yeah. kind of staccato fat thin fat thin fat thin outline is is it, it it both pops and also feels like it's in place where it should be it's sort of you know and that's just one line style of yeah. of the man's genius there is so much stuff that he's he so much so, so incredibly good those yeah. those early strontium dogs are yeah. just incomparable like, I mean, even even earlier than that and doing stuff in battle and the war stuff and it's just an incredible artist and great with technology and and all absolutely convincing mm. to, to, to you know and and the characters that he drew were convincing as well and I think with Apocalypse War it was the first time I think I saw Carlos do anything that was like wow this is really serious this is a this is a proper serious story mm. up, up until then it's it's the you know the fatties and, and, and so on and, and uh, he had such a great caricature style as well. Oh, absolutely! It's a sort of funny, goofy Mega City one, and it's kind of, although my style of artwork is nowhere near, not not anything like Carlos. I don't think um, it, that ability to go from goofy to straight laced oh, totally, is yeah. incredibly admirable, and it's one I would love to, you know, to master in any even a small fraction of the way he did. I didn't I didn't realize how dramatic he could be until Necropolis. Necropolis just completely dropped me on my arse. It was it was well, insane. Those, 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 um, washes with oh. the, the marker pens. Were they marker pen washes? I, 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 yeah, I assumed they were watercolor. It, 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 just it, it, gorgeous. It was, it was a combination of, of, of different things. Where it used to be a watercolor, but it was, it was mostly mostly big marker. marker pens. Jesus it, Christ! It, particularly when you got through to uh, you kind of uh, uh, I'm trying to think uh, uh, sorry, uh, like Inferno. Mm. He'd absolutely mastered that kind of Carl scale of colour yeah. style, which oh, he was, yeah. just, just absolutely incredible. Uh, Rob, um, in terms of Carlos's storytelling, we've already kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, I can't think of anybody better at complimenting John Wagner's 
sparse writing style than somebody who just lays out the story on the page so easily. I mean, I yeah, one of my favourite dreads is probably is the Apocalypse War, and what he did there. I mean, we talked about it here, but it's um, the scale of that story is ex is extraordinary by the very nature of what it is, and uh, and the storytelling is just absolutely crystal clear throughout. Whether it's you know, there's hundreds of uh, nuclear missiles headed, being shot, being vaped, vape baby vape over the city walls, and. Um, uh, it, it's just like he, he did that he did every episode of that I mean it's just like but it is there's something about Carlos's style I think which is just inherently the tone of dread and there's something a bit dirty and sleazy about it all I mean you know it's just it, it, it kind of and again that, that that is sort of like matches I guess John and, and Alan's and you know Pat's vision for what the character was is sort of also one thing I really think about Carlos especially in the wake of the news this week is I don't think I'm not aware of his influences uh, elsewhere. You know, they're probably in European comics and things like that, which we're not too aware of in the Western world. But no one else kind of went and copied Carlos either. There's not a lot of Carlos clones out there. Do you know what I mean? He just had a singular style, which yeah. just like, which was you know, which is amazing because you know how good he was as well. It's 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 amazing there wasn't a bunch of people you could see or you know that you could see Carlos there. Because McMahon was brought in specifically because he could draw like. Uh, uh, Escala at the beginning, yeah, uh, and ended up drawing the, the, the first published episode. But the, he then very quickly developed his own style that, that became so incredibly distinctive. Yeah, but you're right, no, nobody was copying Escala. I mean, is that is that because he's inimitable, or were, were there fancier styles that people wanted to go for? Do you think? Yeah, I think it would be. I, I think it's a. It would be easy to take him for granted over the years because he was so consistent and he was so good. And, and, and his, you know, after the initial Star Lord stuff, I mean, his style seemed to sort of like didn't change that much past the point. But I think also, what you got to, from a writer's point of view, right? You look at like, for me, the best panel in Dread's history is Request Denied, right? And even then, he splits that up into three little staccato panels. He doesn't do it as one panel. It's like, and that's like he's thinking about the storytelling there and the beats of that you know what i mean and and um it's just a, just amazing storyteller i think and i think it's it's kind of easy if you're the you're the full complement if you can do the scale of the apocalypse war and you can tell the human aspects of the story as well and still have that kind of rather sort of sarcastic sardonic style inherent in your you know but if it is in the character and in the tone of how john writes him um yeah, yeah, you can make an argument for like Carlos is the ultimate dread artist, basically. You know? uh, and that kind of ignores this Frontier Dog stuff, which is like yeah, yeah. unbelievable. It is incredible. It's gorgeous. So I, I, I always remember um, uh, they taking you sector one, two, three, mm. uh, which is you know part of the wider uh, uh, pit storyline. And just going back to it recently, because uh, I think it was in the mega collection, um, seeing just episode after episode after episode of carnage you know dread cutting down dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of bad guys and it never gets boring it never gets dull it's always got that sharpness and that sense of oh but it's a cinematic it's it's it's, yeah. it's, it's so it, you know not not to kind of labor the point but it is that uh, spaghetti western yeah feel to it yeah and it's all there and it doesn't matter whether whether he's drawing a strip about you know a, 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 a Mexican mercenary going after both sides in the American Civil War or whether he's drawing a, a future bounty hunter you know it's always well, there well I think the first 2000 E prog I, I, I have my mum brought home from the news agents for me was uh, the fatty uh, wheel storyline and, and like so he could do the extreme silliness and the, the you know the, the the comedy aspects just as well as he could do the you know the, the, the dramatic stuff I mean and again that's kind of inherent of what the dread strip is you know it veers back and forth and is part of the reason why we love it it can be high comedy and completely silly and it can be the darkest thing in the entire world um, so it was like his tone just didn't lend itself to sort of different styles of storytelling as well because he's just telling the story very well you know I mean we, we, without wishing to be in any way morbid what what have we lost here? Not just a, a you know somebody that we knew, somebody that we admired. What has 2000 AD lost in terms of? I mean, I, you know, I, we describe him in our statement as you know we've lost our heart and soul. Yeah, Does it feel I, like I that? Th with I you? think I think 
I think when I look at artists and um, we talk about artists for 2018 and you go, well, there isn't really a house style. There's not a house style. There's not, but it, there is a house style, but it, it starts with Carlos and branches out, I think. And I think we've lost that core. Um, it doesn't mean to say that we, we've lost everything around that. And, and I think Carlos has influenced, I mean, he's, he's left so much amazing material. That, that will always be there and it will always you know it's just the thought that there won't be new car loss is kind of hard to bear a little bit um, but yeah I, I think I think he if you if you want to think about a, an art style for 2080 it starts with car loss I think and it, and it branches even Mike McMahon's art style you go well okay that's thing but that started with Carlos and moved out and everything is measured by the distance from Carlos you know anyone even me or, or you know or an artist like Steve Dillon who's very different from Carlos the measurement is he's very different from Carlos that's you know yeah. so that, it feels like that kind of core is gone but I, I don't think I think we will still that if, if 2080 can hold to that can hold to what Carlos was as an artist and, and the art continues the, you know the, the artists that continue to come in hold to that kind of core I don't think we'll. I don't think it'll necessarily change 2000 AD. It will be sad. That there's no more Carlos. That's for sure. But, but I think that 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 core is run so strongly through the comic um, that it will carry through for 20. 30. That's the legacy of Carlos. Is that is the look of 2000 AD over the next 20, 30 years? I think. Well, it definitely feels like the end of an era because I'm I'm guessing. Carlos must be just behind Wagner and Grant and the number of pages that he created for 2018. Yeah, he's, he's buying, in terms of artists, he's, he's buying away the... the by by factor of like yeah. 10, I'd imagine. Yeah. So, I, I mean, he's... I mean, I, I, whenever I think of 2018, especially my childhood memories of 2018, Carlos is in there drawing dread. In, in that, that's, that's just part of what 2018 is in my mind. And I, I don't think I've really processed the fact that that's not... Like I said, it's the end of an era. That's no longer what's going to be in the pages of AD going forward, and it's it, it really is heartbreaking. I think I can't think of a different uh, another artist who sort of is more in my mind uh, r registers uh, alongside sort of the old print quality mm. and, and and the ink coming off in your fingers. That just <laughs> seems like part of what uh, Carlos's work was. So I think we're all a bit emotional about it because. It's our childhood in a way as well. I mean, you know, regardless if we knew him uh, in, in later life. Um, and and it, Carlos was always there. I mean, it's like a, my first experience of, of, of 2000 in any form was like my mate had some Star Lords around his, uh, around his house. And I remember picking them up and seeing Str Strontium Dog and I go, what's this? You know what I mean? So it feels like, you know, uh, we've, as well as losing a great artist, I think we, we you know, we've, we all feel like we've lost a little bit of our childhood in a weird, weird kind of way, if that makes sense. I think we were very lucky to have Carlos with us for as long as we did. Because by rights, when you you know stuff that you enjoyed in your childhood, you don't get to have anymore as an adult. It's yeah. gone. But we had we had a lot of art from Carlos since then. It's all still great. And I think you know I I, I think that's the heart and soul of where where 2008 is at. I think Duncan Pagredo said on Twitter. He said Carlos is taking the long walk, and I genuinely choked up. So yeah. One of the people who knew Carlos well back in the old days and uh, since it was uh, fellow 2080 artist Dave Gibbons and uh, it's great to have Dave on the line to talk about his memories of Carlos. Dave, tell us a, a little bit about your experience of, of Carlos as, as a person. Carlos as a person, well we, would, we wouldn't meet very often. I mean in the early days uh, the thing was that we shared the same uh, art agent, which was Barden Press Features, mm. uh, in the person of Barry Coker, who uh, placed a lot of uh, British and European artists over at Fleetway and Thompson's. So I would occasionally bump into Carlos in the in the office, uh, and we'd have a chat. But back in those days, and we're talking about the 70s now the mid 70s um carlos's english wasn't so good so it's always a, an, an experience to to have a chat with him because there, there was there was a lot to say from carlos and he he had a mischievous sense of humor as well but it was kind of a question of decoding it or trying to tr 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 trying to translate it i mean it 
later years we tend to bump into each other at uh, comic conventions and things and of course over the years his english became much better and uh, you know we would have some very amusing little chats always as i say the thing i remember is the sense of mischief uh, carlos usually had <laughs> Paint us a, a, a picture a little bit of, of, of those early days, because uh, Carlos had, had moved to Croydon um, mm. to, uh, to, to to be closer to the centre of production, shall we say. Yeah. Um, uh, you only moved occasionally, but what, what was this? Was there a, a great sense of camaraderie amongst the people working on 2080 at the time? Um, I, th- I think so. Uh, I, I mean, um, obviously, Carlos was one of the absolute godfathers of the of the whole thing because you know his stuff i think more than any other artist has run through 2000 ad from the very early days right up until almost the present day whereas others of us although we might in one sense be long-term 2000 ad artists have sort of come and gone or or better known for certain eras Mm. of the uh, comic but carlos was one of those great constants um and i mean the thing that struck me about carlos from the very beginning was what a wonderful character designer he was i mean obviously there was dread himself which is very much carlos uh johnny alpha uh um el mestizo i think that was the name of the Mm. western strip he did um i I mean he, he 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 just you know um illustrated some wonderfully distinctive um characters and i i think um I think the fact that we we worked through the same agent had something to do with it as well, because Barry represented myself and Brian Boland um, and Carlos and a couple of other people whose names escape me for the for the moment. But but we felt like we were on the same on the same team, mm. uh, and um, you know we almost like we lived under the same roof. Um, <laughs> And um, there was there was one particular thing that we did through Pardon Press Features, which I suppose kind of crystallised that. And this was um, this was a comic that we did for the Nigerian market. Some Nigerian advertising people had approached Barry Coker and said, you know, we want to put out um, a, a comic in Nigeria because the only comics you get there at the moment are kind of reprints of British comics, and they all tend to feature like you know blonde world war ii fighter pilots or cricket stars or cowboys you know and it it would be a great idea to give nigeria its own indigenous comic book stories and uh, i remember we had slight misgivings because we thought well aren't there actually artists in nigeria who can do this um but apparently not so uh, myself and brian bolland alternated on the adventures of power man who was a sort of a black superman i Mm. guess and the thing that carlos drew um again i'm blanking on the name of it but it was a space invasion thing by this race of aliens called i seem to remember called the hornu who (laughs) had sort of unicorn horns growing out of their foreheads which sounds kind of dopey but carlos managed to pull it off and it it was rather refreshing change because rather than the space aliens invading britain or america they'd actually invaded africa so that there was a there was a really different flavor to the stories and so um us three in particular would and ron smith as well worked on some some of the stories for those comics and it was a fortnightly deadline and i think that that kind of built a camaraderie and that's where we bump into each other when we got into the office on press day to deliver our work mm-hmm. and in terms of something like 2000 ad uh, you know there's there's uh, yourself there's mick um there's uh, kevin o'neill uh ron smith you know there's there's, there's this kind of a, a team of 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 their own of, of people working on 2000 ad and you describe carlos as like one of the godfathers mm. how much was what he was producing influencing you and 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 the people around you at the time if indeed it was well yeah i mean it was it was always an influence because because it, it i mean it had carlos's work had such an impact and and you know just exactly fitted um the kind of uh, ethos or the, or the general personality of 2000 ad i think i think the thing that i would say about carlos's work is that um 
it, he made it look so simple. Mm. It almost looked like the kind of thing that a kid could draw themselves. You know, I, I used to draw in the back of my maths rough book, I used to draw like World War Two dog fights. Mm. And so I draw a Spitfire coming in and a, and a hurricane or an ME 109 coming the other way. And then I'd sort of draw the bullets passing in, in, in between them. You know, and and there was something about the way Carlos drew that had the kind of kinetics that that kind of schoolboy drawing would have. But Carlos's drawing was much more polished, but it did retain that energy and that sense of fun and that sense of involvement. And, you know, a lot of us became known perhaps for our elegant rendering styles, particularly I think of Brian. And Carlos wasn't interested in having that kind of slightly um, effete, uh, kind of polite way of drawing. He drew in a very, uh, uh, you know, visceral way and, and his work would always sort of be be bursting with it. As I say, almost a kind of schoolboy enthusiasm. Of course, when you looked at it, you realised that it was tremendously more sk- skillfully done than anything I'd done in my maths rough book. <laughs> but it still had an informality to it and a lack of, a lack of any surface that would that would off put the reader at all, mm. and he was always he was always about the drama. He was always about the nitty gritty of the characters. I mean, when I think of, of his sort of range of facial expressions and the, the the kind of you know the way he posed figures as well in a very straightforward but really interesting way, so that you were you were never in any doubt as to what the story point was, and really to my mind like all great comic artists it was all about telling the story and the drawing was really just incidental the Mm. drawing had to just be good enough to dramatize the story that he was trying to tell um so that 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 i think was something about his art also um carlos was really one of the first people as far as i'm aware to um to use the computer for coloring on a regular basis i mean he used to do a lot of full color work anyway that would be watercolors and dyes but but i remember having a long conversation with him about his method for coloring it on the computer and for a long while he used a program called painter corel painter Mm. which was quite a complex coloring solution but carlos used to make it work really well and 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 would never be um uh, tempted into doing things that were smooth or artificial it always had that energy of being hand painted so you know he was somewhat of a pioneer in that respect mm. do, do you think it's possibly one of the reasons why he's not more well known outside of of, of british comics or anyone who's come into contact with him through through the the, the bits and bobs he, he, he did for america because um it, it was less about the style and more about the storytelling um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, I mean, his work, I thought, looked just great in um, American comics, mm. too, because, again, they dealt in the sort of slightly l- larger-than-life, tragic comic sort of stuff that 2000 AD did. Um, but I think, really, um, 2000 AD, or Battle as well, for which he, he did many strips, I think... The British comic scene was actually much closer to Carlos's um, attitudes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, American comics again tend to be a little bit more polite and a little bit more restrained. Um, so, I, I mean, he did some fantastic work there, and was obviously, I mean, since the news of him passing away came out, I mean, there've been tremendous tributes from American artists who, whether in the American comics or whether in reprints of the British comics, are very familiar with his work and uh, recognise just what what a great original talent he was. Mm. And, I mean, this is, this is quite a broad question. We've already kind of touched on it a little bit, but what do you think his legacy is? Oh, boy. Well, um, I mean, I think you would, you would have to say dread because mm-hmm. I, I mean dread has clearly become one of those pantheon of uh, of comic characters that is that will last as long as there are comics or as long as there are <laughs> comic strip based and en- entertainment and certainly um i mean that is one of the absolute classic designs um so i think that is 
really his legacy. I mean, it's strange. I, I, you asked me at the beginning of my personal recollections of him. Um, I was lucky enough once with Brian Bolland to actually go and visit him in Croydon, which seems such an unlikely place for <laughs> a fiery Spaniard, Spaniard like Carlos to end up. Um, he didn't stay in Croydon very long because, as I remember him saying, I don't like bloody income tax. So so that was why he moved to Andorra, where I, I believe they don't actually pay income tax. Um, so it it, it it was that about England that repelled him rather than, as you might expect, Croydon. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I remember Brian and I visited him and it was fascinating. I only got a glimpse of him working, but he worked in a very straightforward and unfussy way. He'd pencil out really, really loosely and quickly from what, what I could see. Mm-hmm. And then he would ink with a, um, it was like a cheap kind of platinum fountain pen with um, ink in it. Mm-hmm. And um, he would get, he would, you know, dash the stuff down really quickly and then go back in with a brush and bold and some lines up. But he was, he was a, a real no nonsense guy and could, could really work very, very quickly because um, because of his unfussy approach. And the other thing I remember about that day was that his wife, Conchita, who was an absolutely charming woman, made Brian and I a wonderful Spanish meal with Spanish omelette and lovely salad and bread and everything, everything like that. And they were really the perfect hosts as well. And, you know, um, I, I, re- I remember the kind of their warmth from that day. And I think that's the thing that I will remember the most about Carlos is his warmth as a human being mm. and his wonderful mischievous sense of humour. Another chat from New York was with Al Ewing and artist Simon Fraser, who also had some really interesting things to say about how they relate to Carlos and his work. So, uh, Simon Fraser, Al Ewing, um, Ghanaian artist Ali at New York Comic Con. Oh. Obviously a very sad week. For yeah. Anybody who knows anything about 2018, yeah. what, what, what's been your reaction to what, what, what has happened? Uh, do you want to go first? Um, I mean, I first reaction was just stunned. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had a little cry, frankly, yeah. and then I saw the drawing. Somebody put up a, a, a drawing of his. He'd done one of the last ones he'd done, and there's a lot of 2008 characters in there, and he did a little Dante in there, and I actually cried again. <laughs> so yeah, it was really upsetting. Um, I mean, I didn't really know Carlos very well, but he treated like you, like you, like he knew you really well. Yeah. And that meant an awful lot because we all grew up yeah. with 2000 AD, and it was like he was, he was like our uncle. I mean, John, you know, John's not that guy, but Carlos is that guy. He's like <laughs> just he give you the big hug, and it's like he's just the happiest guy to see you, and the happiest guy to be there, and just the happiest, just most joyful, full of life. I can't imagine not them being not being around. It's just I don't. It's I don't know. I you know, we all know, we all know. I still, I don't think I've processed it yet, still. Um, I've been, it's, it's been, you know, it's been a, a busy week for me. This has always been sort of lurking in the background, like, you know, eventually I'm going to have to start thinking about this, eventually I'm going to have to, like... But, I mean, right now, I, I guess, I mean, I, I was not lucky enough to know Carlos well. Um, I, I met him on a couple of occasions. He was, he was always very gracious and very friendly and everything everything Simon was saying there um, I so I guess right now my feeling is it's very similar to like when when Bowie died or when Ditko died this this yeah. vast yeah. this vast man who was like such an enormous piece of your your personal cultural topography and and now he's gone and we're not gonna we're not gonna get any more of that art we're not gonna get any more of him you know yeah. he's his work is complete he's left us and that is, yeah, that is something that um, we'll have to get used to. And you know, we're now in we're now in a post Carlos world. Um, I I don't mean that, you know, I don't mean that to sound flippant, or uh, but there is this thing of like the 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 hugeness of the loss, uh, and from a cultural perspective. Yeah. And from like the perspective of part of your childhood, a part of your own personal history, you know, without 
Without Carlos, there would be no Judge Dredd. Without Judge Dredd, would I even be standing here yeah. in New York? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Carlos is the re. And Carlos is part of the reason I'm here. And you know, he he gave us all that. And now he's gone. And yeah, we're all processing it. We're all dealing with it. I've been I've been here at the table most of the, all day, and basically people have been coming past, and almost everybody said we're really sorry for your loss, as it's a personal loss, and it really is. And even people who didn't really know his work very well understand how important he was. Um, and I've been talking about his work all day, yeah. like you know the power of it, the, the things you learn from his work is good, the sort of visceral power of it, and the fact it doesn't have to be right. You don't have to be right about everything you draw. It just has yeah. to mean something. It has to have that kind of like intention and everything he drew had intention and power and strength because he really everything he did he meant his whole life he meant everything he did he committed to it and it's something to learn as an artist it's something to learn as a human being it's something to learn um, he was a great exemplar of that just complete commitment to everything he did uh, it's, it's been very nice uh, listening to people talk about, even if they didn't know him particularly well, but if they just met him or, or yeah. heard stories about meeting him, just, as I said in, 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 our, in our statement, it, it's, it's rare that you get that combination of actual genuine genius, somebody who, who has a, had a profound effect on so yeah. many people, and yet is so humble about it as well. And unassuming, and and fun. He's and just fun. a fun guy. Yeah, he really was. I remember sitting the first time I ever saw him in the flesh. I sat beside, beside my UCAC. He was sitting there at the bar talking to I think John or someone else. And I was sitting there quietly going, I don't know. I was like going quietly out of my mind. Um, and I think I eventually sort of said hello. And he was so nice about it, but it didn't mean anything to him. He said 500 hellos that day to people who were all completely intimidated by him. But he was totally charming and totally lovely. And that's how he always was. He was always just the, the nicest man. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for his family, his friends, and everybody. Yeah. Like, Because I know he was loved, and it's, it's a big thing. One of the newer generations of uh, artists who have been influenced by Carlos uh, and his work at 2000 AD is Jock, who joins me on Skype. Jock... Tell me a little bit about how Carlos has influenced your work and uh, and, and and just the way that, that that you and your your style has developed. Yeah, I've been thinking about this obviously since the since the sad news. Um, I, I I think the main thing for me when I was younger reading his stuff was was the 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 world building that he was able to do. Like you know, reading the stories, it, they felt real somehow. Mm. Uh, and, and I kind of think all the best comic artists do that, you know, to to varying degrees. But Carlos was was a master of it. I, I feel like um, I think. Uh, it was Portrait of a Mutant, maybe, with uh, Johnny Alpha as, as a kid. I, I remember reading that, and, and that was at the moment that something clicked with me with, with, with Carlos's work, and, and I was just completely transported into the, you know, and it's quite a touching story as, as well for, for its time. And, and, and I remember Carlos's work really, uh, you know, really, really did it for me. And, and from, from that moment on, I was a, I was a massive fan. I mean, no, well, I, was, I was a fan anyway, but, but that's when I realised quite how kind of good he was. Mm. Mm. And as somebody growing up reading 2000 AD, um, I mean, he, he was a, a he was just always a presence there, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because I, I came to 2000 AD relatively late for people of my generation. I was about 14, something like that. So, so um, uh, I'm so jealous of, of of the kids that that that, that read the stuff at like seven and eight because yeah. it, it it blew the back of my head off at 14. I, I, I dread to think what it would have what it would have done to me. At, seven or eight um, <laughs> um but yeah he was yeah i mean he was so prolific as well you, you know he's his is he, he's done so many pages so many stories um uh and i remember w once once i did discover 2080 I, I kind of you know just searched everywhere for as much material as i could get so i was buying all the eagle reprints and all the quality comic monthly reprints and you know things like stainless steel rat all the strontium dog stuff and obviously all, all his dread stuff was just kind of it was, um, yeah, he was a, a complete um, sort of like, you know, a, a kind of building block of, of 2018. You know, he was, he was like one of the ABC building blocks. And mm. he was, uh, you know, uh, and, yeah, an, an amazing man as well. And it's really sad news, mm. really sad. And, and, and as an artist looking at his work now, what, what are the elements 
that stand out to you? I mean, you've already talked about storytelling. Yeah, uh, he's very gritty. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's very gritty. Uh, like uh, there's a dirtiness to, to, to the way that he drew stuff that um, that uh, you know is is kind of it's it's. Uh, What's the right? Has the right way to put it? It's like it. It, it, it seems like it, it. It looks like it'd be easy to do, but it's not because mm. there's a there's a you know there's his world un, un, underneath it all. It's, it's not about the scrappy marks. It's kind of how he's kind of uh, suggesting uh, the world that he's drawing. And um, for me, yeah, that kind of gritty dirtiness, that, that, like like a kind of worn, weathered look to everything, is, is I think is essential to, to the reality of some of the stuff in 2018. Um, and those weird blobs that you put around figures like, uh, as well. I still don't quite know what they were about, but um, I, I guess there's something to do with popping the figure forward in a graphic way. But they were, I remember seeing them first and just thinking, what, you know, but they just kind of worked. Mm. Um, so, yeah, for me, he, he just sort of forged ahead with his own style. And, and, and that's maybe, actually, yeah, maybe that, that's the thing that I take most from, uh, f- from, from his work, that he was able to kind of do his thing and for it to be very successful and great to read and look terrific. Um, yeah. And you, you've got a, a rather lovely page on your wall from, uh, from Carlos, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a double page spread from uh, Apocalypse War, and it's got a nice message from Carlos to me, which is uh, which is fantastic. But um, yeah, years ago when I was uh, uh, working for 2000 AD, and I was delivering some pages to Andy Diggle in in, in the London office, and um, I was uh, waiting for Andy to finish work to go for a pint, probably. Um, <laughs> that sounds very and, um, unlike you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I had like a, sort of 45 minutes or an hour to kill in the office and I was just sort of looking around and, and they always had these kind of piles of just little uh, pages, bits and pieces sort of hanging around um, in like a store cupboard type area. And um, I was flicking through and I noticed that the summer bank raid was in there, um, which is, you know, the, the, the first, supposedly the first ever completed dread story. It, it wasn't the first printed, but it was the first uh, completed work. And there's a very fam- the, the page one had a very famous shot of dread on his law masters bursting out of the page. That I think got reused repurposed when the first dread story did mm. appear, I think in yeah. talk two, I think, um, which Mick McMahon drew, but it was Carlos's, uh, yeah, shot on the bike anyway. But yeah, but it was bank rate. And I was like, Holy shit, this is, you know, Andy, do you know what this is? This is like, <laughs> this is a piece of history. Mm. And it had clearly been in the offices for the 25 years or, 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 or whatever it was at that point. Um, you know, so I said to Andy, do you think Carlos would, would, you know, sell this, swap this, do something with it? And he said, well, let me ask. And he phoned Carlos and Carlos just asked me to send him a cover and then I could take that page home. So, which I did. And I, um, and about a year later, he he, uh, I, th- I think uh, word got got to him that what it actually was that it was bank raid, and he asked if he could get it back, and I said, well, of course. And Rufus Deglo took it over to him in in Andorra, in Spain, um, and and you know I felt lucky to have had the page for like a year in my studio. This was quite early on for me as well, mm. so I was just starting out, and it felt you know quite an honour to have that page in my studio. But it went back to Carlos, which is kind of like his rightful home anyway. But then uh, Rufus. Uh, saw him a month or two later and he had brought a nice big page from Carlos as a gift to say thank you, uh, which now hangs in my studio. Mm. And, and uh, <laughs> without wishing to, to be too sentimental about it, what, what, what does, what does that page mean to you when you, when you look at it, what's the, the overwhelming feeling? Well, I, I, I remember when I got it, it was in 2005. So, um, uh, I hadn't been drawing comics for very long, and and even at, like at, at that at that point, and Carlos was there. By the way, it was, it was at a Dreadcon, so it was mm. the first time I'd met him. And to me, it was just incredible that he even knew a who I was, b that he'd want one of my drawings for for his home, and and c that I had, you know, a piece of work that had meant so much to me, you know, growing up and and shaping kind of what I now do. Mm. Um, you know, personalised to me, and of course now since the news, it's it's you know it's it's taken on a slightly. I'm just going to treasure it much more now, basically, um, uh, and it's never coming down off off my wall. <laughs> do, do you think as somebody who works in American comics uh, and and wider? Do, do you think um, first off that, that that he's known outside of 2000 AD, uh, and 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 if he isn't, is there a reason why why he should be? 
Um, I think uh, like because he has done a bunch of American mm. comics, hasn't he? He did a stuff, a bunch of stuff with Garth. I yeah. seem to remember Garth Ennis, um, and he's done bits and pieces for DC. I, I, I think his I think his work is a harder sell in America, perhaps. Um, there's one of the phrases I hate, which I think is I think actually in this day and age is kind of disappearing now, but certainly in the sort of eighties, nineties, maybe more relevant is you know he he was maybe too European for mm. for, for the American market. Um, um, but then, but then, funny enough, just today, Bill Sienkiewicz uh, uh, put a portrait of him, you know, on, on on Twitter. So he was obviously in, in the comics industry. If everyone knew who he was, um, and 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 the mark that he made. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I always got the sense that I guess he was content working for 2008. You know, the, you know that 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 was enough. I mean, if you'd created Dread and Strontium Dog, you know, that that may well be enough. Frankly, you know, that's uh, that's that's an incredible legacy to leave behind. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I never spoke to him about about whether he wanted to do more for the American market or whether he had aspirations in other things. But I always, I always got the sense that that, that you know his home, he's sort of belonged at 2080 somehow. Well, thank you for joining us on what is a really bittersweet episode of the 2080 podcast, Earthlets. Thank you to everyone who's taken part. They're just a fraction of the people that Carlos and his work have touched over the years. Friends, colleagues, and also fans. Thank you for listening. Like I said at the head of the episode, please make sure to send us your tributes on social media and email, and we'll get uh, to as many of them as we, as we possibly can. To round off this episode, we're going to go back to 2015, 4th of March, when we were celebrating Judge Dredd's birthday. And we had the master himself, Carl Skerler, on the podcast to talk about the creation of possibly his greatest, most well-known character, Judge Dredd. So sit back, enjoy, bask in the legacy of one of the greatest all-time artists, Carl Skerler. Hi, hello. It's nice to be back again. Tell us uh, a, a, a bit about how you came to be working for 2000 AD in the first place, how you came to be the artist that, that co-created Judge Dredd? Uh, I suppose the fault is from John Wagner and Pat Mills. They saw my work for uh, DC Thompson, and um, the, so they called me for to Fleetway. I started working with um, uh, Battle Magazine mm -hmm. and creating uh, Rat Pack and Major Ishi. And, uh, and then later El Mestizo. They were very quite, very successful, especially with Major Ishi. So when they gave 2018 come out, uh, I don't know, uh, I suppose John Wagner and Pat Mill, they, they thought I was uh, a very good choice to work uh, for the magazine. So, um, well, they give me the, the first script of Jazz Dread. And uh, I made my own interpretation, and especially uh, Pat Mills, he liked so much that he changed all the script to adapt to the character I created. Because uh, um, uh, there's, there's that very famous uh, uh, quote from uh, from John Wagner when he saw your your design for Judge Dredd, which was, he he said. Uh, um, we can't use that. He he looks like a um, expletive Spanish pirate. Yes, exactly, and if. Dot, 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 Spanish pirate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let, let, let's, let's just go back for a moment and, and talk about your work on uh, on Battle Week, uh, Battle Picture Weekly and, and uh, Action Comic. Because you mentioned um, uh, Rat Pack, uh, Major Easy and uh, El Matido. Um, specifically Major Easy, I mean, th that was very much the kind of uh, 1970s uh, wartime anti-hero, wasn't he? Yes, it was the time when the kind of films like uh, Marsh and uh, Kelly Harrell and all these um, uh, clinical good films, they start coming in the, the, in the screen. So it was that kind of character that it was, um, it was made uh, with my origin, you know, the kind the character that is hero but he's also at the same time he's an anti-hero yeah he's anti-establishment and because uh, you you'd um your experience up until that point was working on uh romance comics wasn't it and 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 just kind of just more sort of contemporary things no the romantic comic it was um romance comic it was before i come to i come to live to england 
Then I go to with DC Thompson working in adventures stories. Mm. Like uh, I think one of the most uh, famous in bracket, he was uh, chained to his world. And uh, well, and another similar to that, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it was the kind of, of stories I was doing for, for DC Thompson. Did um, did uh, battle and action allow you to uh, to to express yourself a bit more, be a bit more experimental in in, in what you were doing? Yes, uh, because uh, the good thing about battle um, is that I have total total freedom to do whatever I wanted. Well, not only battle, but then later on, in two thousand AD, or and so I have total uh, freedom to do with my characters whatever I feel. And that was very important because um, in that way I can, well, I come from Spain. In Europe in, that, in those moments also was a big, uh, uh, of a, like a movement of changing comics, like a little bit like a revolution. It was Guido Crepax, uh, Saga de Sam. And uh, so I, when I go to England, I bring with me some of the ideas that they were uh, in vogue in Europe. Mm. And I think that was very important for the for the British comics uh, in general because uh, it was I bring the mix in between the two the two um, the two um, continents you know well the two the yeah continent. yeah the the, 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 tr- the traditions of two quite different uh, comics industries yes mm. and uh, I, I, I it was only possible to do that in um, in a magazine like Battle. Mm, having total freedom to do whatever I wanted. As normally in DC Thompson, you have to follow a very strict lines, and you cannot do mm, uh, well. You cannot do whatever you want. You have to follow some lines, mm. and even visually, you cannot do too many things. As in each page, it was something like say ten, twelve pictures per page. Mm. So you were very much restricted to do little squares, more or less all, all of the similars. That must have been incredibly uh, uh, freeing when 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 you got to to, to battle and to action and and to two thousand AD. Yes, it was like a breath, uh, um, a bit of a, a fresh air, you know, mm. uh, doing whatever I wanted and without any restrictions at all. In, in, in that moment, in battle, it was uh, Dave Hunt as editor, and well, only have uh, support from him, you know, mm. have no problem at all. Even if uh, in my agent in those times, it was Barry Cooker from Bardon Press. He, every time I do some comics for battle, he was a little bit afraid mm. because mm. he said, well, it's too much for England. We are more conservative. <laughs> but I always say, okay, you just present my work. If they don't like, I will repeat it. Yeah. But present as it is now and uh, never have any problem. Was it, was it a big... Uh, um a big change or a, a big relief or a big challenge that, that you'd gone from working on um, what were either contemporary stories or um, historical stories. So El Matillo is, uh, um, that's the Mexican Civil War, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Rat Pack and Major Easy, which are World War Two. To go on to something like 2000 AD, where, um, particularly with Judge Dredd, it, it's it's highly futuristic and you kind of took it and 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 uh, took the situation and took it even further than than uh, John and Pat had intended in the first place. No, I was uh, just letting my imagination fly. Hmm. And uh, more or less also I tried to do a, a little bit the same with the war story, but uh, more uh, being uh, with the reality, you know, as, um, following the, the guns, the tanks, all this has to be very realistic. But at the same time, you try to do something, to put some imagination. Mm. So uh, when I started with Just Dread, uh, no, I don't think it was it was too too much of a change, you know. Mm. Mm. The only thing it was just to do whatever I wanted, uh, following also the pattern that I learned with Battle, and is that every time I do uh, guns, even if they are futuristic, or vehicles, or things like that, uh, has to be uh, possible to do it, you know? Right, uh, so, so they have to look like they work. Yes, mm. exactly. That was very important. Also, even if I, I do aliens, I try to do uh, realistic, in brackets, you know, realistic aliens. <laughs> sure. 
And, and uh, d- tell us a bit about the uh, the inspiration behind uh, the, the 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 uniform for Judge Dredd, which which remains uh, utterly unique, both in its um, uh, uh, extreme nature and, and and that wonderful silhouette. What what were the things that that came together in your mind to create that? Well, uh, they give me a, a picture of uh, I think it was Dave Carradine. Mm. Carradine. Um, in, in how it was called this film, the film. Oh, Death, uh, death Race. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, well, the, the, the shoot that Carandine uh, was uh, having, is, it was si- a simply um, an overall in, in leather. Mm. And then just thinking, say, well, you know, it has to be protected, so you put some to protect the shoulders, like one of the of the American uh, football players uh, has to be protected in the elbows, in in all the parts, you know, the knees. Mm. So uh, you just protected. Then in a society where it was a lot of well millions of people in the in mega city, and the the agent has to be recognized very easily. Then I changed the the protection, especially in the in the right shoulder. I put an eagle, you know, like um, mm. an American eagle, mm. or also it can be a fascist eagle, Roman or, or German, or the eagle also from Spain, that uh, it was where I came in from, from that moment, you know, mm. from the General Franco uh, Spain. So, mm, well, after that, I don't think it was something logical to, to go one thing after the other. Mm. And even the badge, I Take it from a Spanish coin that it was the eagle with the with the, the with the shield in, in top in front of the eagle, and uh, as I say, you know, it was from one of the, the Spanish twenty five uh, pesetas coins. Because uh, uh, of course, at the at the time, you were you were living in a fascist state. Yes, exactly. It was uh, still it was alive, uh, General Franco. Hmm. So uh, I I put some. Um, well, uh, how can I say? Uh, some details that they were fascistic into just mm-hmm. dread. But at the same time, um, well, it has to be also very stern. So that was the, the and as it was uh, just Yuri, an executor, I made the helmet like a, an executor from the, from the Middle Ages. Mm. Instead of being in cloth, it was uh, solid, you know. It was like a, like a, it was a helmet. Yeah. And uh, I think it was a very, um, how can I say, a very practical shoot. The proof is that uh, today most of the, of the policemen, uh, they are dressed very similar to yours. <laughs> And and also I suppose that is the reason he survived for such a long time. With um, Chris Sims, who, who's the, the 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 chap I was talking to um, earlier in this podcast, uh, he's he's commented on on Judge Dredd's costume before that the, the normal rule, the one that everyone seems to to, to follow, is that. Um, simpler is better so you look at batman you look at superman um uh, green lantern you know they have they have a single symbol and and it's all primary colors and um it's all spandex um and the idea is that uh that that single symbol just kind of stands out on its own and and, and encompasses the entire character but with judge dread there's all these uh elements going on but you you manage to kind of uh, exaggerate them and make them bigger and bigger, and other artists have, have taken that on over the years. Did you did you realise at the time just how much fun other people were going to have playing with your core design? I don't know. Some, some artists they hate me for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know when I did that, uh, you have to remember that Just Dread is an American policeman, mm. and normally the American policeman they are, uh, especially in the sixties and seventies. They were everything but uh, simple. Mm. You know, big motorbikes full of uh, lights, um, well, big gun, and a lot of uh, patches in the in the cell. They were not exactly something very simple, but too simple, you know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and also that has developed into the anti riot policeman from today. That is also, if you look at him, is like um, like a a knight from the Middle Ages. Mm. 
you designed uh, Judge Dredd and, and had such an influence on the creation of Mega City One because of the the, the, the pinup that you did that that, um, that Pat Mills really liked. Um, but then you you walked away uh, from from Dredd for for a couple of years. Do you want to uh, explain a bit about what happened there? Well, uh, the main thing, even if uh, some other people, Pat Mills has another ideas about what I walk it away. <laughs> the real thing is. Uh, uh, the, the first story printed it was one from Mike Van Wow. Mm. And not only that, but Mike Van Wow was forced to copy me and to uh, to put some of my figures even in the in the comic. Mm. So I resented. You know, normally the many of the of the artists we, we are a bit like a big head. You know, you can say, and uh, and we resent many of those things. You know, I made the first story and. It was terrible for me just to see that the first one published it was from, from another from another artist. I don't mind, you know, because I never thought in doing just by myself, just read all the time. But at least the first one that is where, and especially in those times, the first one is like uh, the, the one who established who was the creator of the character and the story. Mm. So for me it was like, um, I don't know, like a, a back, <laughs> yeah, I feel I feel very bad in this. So you know, I decided. I said, "Well, never more. I am going to work for 2000 AD." Right. And I return uh, to battle. And when when uh, afterwards uh, was created Star Lord, and uh, I was asked uh, with young one uh, for uh, to do a strong mm. dog. My idea always was to take out from the number one just dread and to and to have strong tune dog, you know. Mm. But uh, well, sometimes it was the number one, but uh, but most of the time it was the second one. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, skipping forward uh, a, a few years, the Apocalypse War was your return. To dread after after walking away at, at, uh, from the strip at the beginning, what encouraged you to come back um, to 2000 AD, and 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 how did it feel to be drawing him again? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, well after some time, I never been uh, a person who lasts too much. Hmm. You know, um, my my grievance with with anything at all, and then in the end, after say, well, you know, after all, is mine. So why why not? You know, I don't have any problem with that. So when I was asking to do to do some stories and especially long ones, mm. you know, I, I was very happy to to do it. And it, I mean, it was a hell of a comeback to to um, to have created the character, walked away, and then to come back with something like the Apocalypse War, where, as you say, it is a long story and 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 such a tour de force as well. Yeah, well, uh, remember that also in those times. Now I am a bit more slower, and, but in those times I was the fastest pen in the West, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have another question uh, on that very theme uh, coming yeah. coming up. And uh, I can work very fast, you know. I, well, I, I can work also very fast. So uh, when they offer me a long story, I don't doubt. You know, I say, okay, I do it, and I do it all by myself. I never like it very much to do a story with many other with many other people you know i think mm. the reader always preferred to to start with one artist and to finish with the same art mm. i mean it, it's it's interesting that of course block war the, the story that immediately precedes uh the apocalypse war is exactly the kind of story that you're that you're sort of um rebelling against because uh, you had Steve Dillon, you had Brian Bolland, uh, you had Mick McMahon, you had Ron Smith, you know, all, all these uh, uh, artists working on a, a single story and it, it's very choppy in comparison to, to them when the Apocalypse War gets going and there's such a consistency of art all the way through. Yes, as I say, you know, it's not only with the Apocalypse War, but also it was, I don't know, uh, uh, Origins and also Necropolis. Mm. And uh, I always prefer, if it's a long story, I prefer to do it by myself, even if I has to work my hand, you know, to the bones. And uh, but I think it's, it's better for the for the reader, the fans. They prefer that, you know, start with one artist 
and finish with the same artist. Mm, mm. Because if not, and especially in, with characters like Jazz Dread, that each, art, each uh, artist have their own interpretation, it can be a bit confusing for the for the reader. Mm. Now, I understand you were living in uh, Croydon at the time that you were doing the uh, the Apocalypse War. And uh, I, 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 when I've gone back to, to, to my old notes, um, you'd bring in episodes each week into the 2008 uh, office. But is it true that you were turning around about six pages of black and white artwork a week? Yes. Right. I mean, that's uh, uh, the, there may well be comic book artists who uh, who are listening to this who kind of have a funny turn when <laughs> when they hear that kind of rate of work. I mean, it, uh, you you described yourself as the the fastest pen in the West. Was it was it a case of just spending all day every day drawing, or, or were you just really quick and get, uh, it, get it done and out the door? No, it's because I I, I, I am I am very quick. You know, mm. I, well. I, Especially in West. Now I take everything more more easy. But um, for me, it's very easy to imagine things. So once I got it in my in my in my head, I just has my my hands has to follow whatever my, is in my head. So I don't have too much uh, too much of a problem. Well, also you my my style of work is not as finished as, for example, Brian Boland or, or Dave Gibbons is more more finished more. So they, they spend more time on it. I am more interested in the in the characters to be alive, and uh, and the people see exactly what is happening there. But especially the characters to be alive, mm. and you know, to be alive, you don't need to finish too much the characters. Uh, it's difficult to very difficult to explain. Right. Okay. Okay. Um. Now, Alan Grant has said that he doesn't uh, remember him and Wagner especially enjoying writing Apocalypse War at the time, which which is odd because it just seems so uh, gleefully sadistic to the people of Mega City One, um, though he appreciates it more upon coming back to it. Uh, did you enjoy drawing it? Uh, I don't remember. It's quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, no I, I always enjoy it. Whatever I am doing, I enjoy it. Hmm. If I start doing something that I don't, or even well before it, when I, I am giving an script, and I see, and I don't like it, I don't take it, mm. because normally then it can take me ages to do it, and uh, and then if I, I don't enjoy it, I don't see the point to do it. Yeah, well, if your if your heart isn't in it, there's no point in doing it. Exactly, unless I was pay you know very high quantity of money. <laughs> Which it was not the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, just looking at the uh, um, at the big sort of center spreads uh, and the big uh, page Im uh, single page images of the Apocalypse War, it, it, it seems as if you were having a good time. Just because um, everything is so is so detailed, is so um, uh, full of. Uh, emotion and and uh you know if, if if you look at the way even um even something such as the uh the laser screen taking down the russian missiles as they they're heading towards mega city one i mean the, the the amount of detail on that page is just is just incredible how how much of this was guided by uh john and alan and how much was you um adding stuff in i think i think uh most of it it was from from john and alan you know because uh, they were very dynamic scripts, mm. and uh, uh, I just read it, and for me it was like seeing a film. So I, I don't have too much problem in, in putting that in on paper. Mm. So I think you know the most of the of the of the um, uh, of the story was due to the to the good scripts. But not only that, but always that happened with to me always. You know, with the with the script from John Wagner. Uh, and Alan Grant, but uh, because the proof is after forty something years, I am very happy working with John. Mm. I, th I think John uh, has gone on the record several times as saying that that he, he, your relationship over the past thirty odd years, well, forty years, um, yes. has uh, uh, has got to the point where now he he can trust you to do exactly what he 
knows that you will do, and you've you've developed a, a, a quite a deep understanding about what the other is is, is capable of. Yeah, well, the main thing is that uh, we are very well comp- compenetrated, you know. Yeah. So I, when I do something, I know that uh, it's more or less whatever he is thinking. Out, and when he writes something, is uh, he writing something that uh, he know I'm going to develop? Well, I, I don't know. You know, we are very, very well compenetrated. Right? <laughs> it's a bit normal after, five, as I say, after forty years working together. Uh, you develop something like, um, I don't say telepathy, but something similar. Mm. Mm. Like a, 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 a bond between yes, you. Yes, even yeah. sometimes, you know, I, I really feel very angry with him when he starts just saying, well, 50 people in one picture are fighting. I say, bloody. <laughs> 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 but that is normal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I think a lot of artists uh, struggle with that one, where uh, where a, a writer just has to write a line saying, you know, two two armies fight uh, in in the middle of a, a forest, and you know, what God's yeah, sake, um, you know. I I always ask him, why don't you do a single guy in the middle of the desert, nothing else, you know? <laughs> but um, anyway, you know that is uh, as as you say, it's a normal complaint there from the artist. Mm. But, uh, 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 sorry, go on. Yeah, no, that, uh, you know, uh, working with him has been, uh, I, in all my life, I've been working with you for uh, writers that um, are very, very well compenetrated, you know. Mm. John, Alan, Garthenis, uh, Pat Mills, mm, and you, uh, I work, you know, it's very easy for me to work with them. Mm. Okay. Have you, have you gone back and reread uh, The Apocalypse War? recently no right okay okay um is 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 that uh, a decision to to not go back and reread your old stuff or or are you always looking forward or yeah well because normally i never read my own stuff mm. after a while you know it's uh, no i never i never read it i for me always the best story is the one i am going to do now uh the Apocalypse War, and this is something that I talked to, to Chris earlier about, it's the first time that um, Mega City 1 faces some uh, real major destruction. Um, you know, the, people had chucked nukes at it before and, and there'd, there'd, there'd been uh, sectors destroyed, but this this was Alan and, and John cutting the, 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 the city in half. And it, it was the first time that, that you were involved in destroying big parts of the city because you've got the apocalypse war you've got necropolis and then you had the inferno uh yeah. storyline later um is, is is it fun to do to do to blow up your own creation uh i never thought of that <laughs> <laughs> you know i just uh, do it and yes it's fun <clears throat> i suppose it's fun you know but i never thought about that i really enjoy doing it and um, that's it, you know, it's, uh, um, I don't know, you know, I, I never thought about that. Mm. Well, I, I, I think um, someone uh, in the office uh, worked out how many uh, fictional lives uh, John, Allen, and yourself are responsible for, for, for killing, and I think it makes the uh, the three of you some of the biggest mass murderers in uh, in fictional history. It's, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> quite remarkable. <laughs> yes, you know, we, but the thing is, we three, we have a very, very black soul, so <laughs> <laughs> you cannot expect any others <laughs> I, d- I do have one last question. Of, of all the dread villains you've created, from from Precious Leglock to War Marshal Kazan and Sabat and all the other stories that you've done for for Judge Dread, is 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 there a a, a, a a villain that that sticks in your mind as one of your your favourites? Uh, no, maybe Marcel War Kazan is one of the of the most yeah of the most important. Maybe I think. Mm. That uh, and I really enjoyed doing doing him. You know, it was, uh, it was. I think it was one of the 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 more yeah, sticking to my mind. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, what what were the, what were the elements of 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 that character that that, that sort of you enjoyed? Uh, because he was um, he was very similar to uh, 
to an, a, a dictator, you know. Uh, and in those times, I still, I still was very fresh to me, Franco, uh, Franco regime in Spain. So, mm. uh, if you notice, it's a little mustache, very similar to the one uh, Franco and all these uh, fascist guys were having. And, uh, well, I try to reflect something like that on him. <laughs> So a, a, a little bit of, uh, of political satire in uh, in facial hair in the Apocalypse War. Yes, even if it, even if it, it was only for me, you know, yeah. nobody else <laughs> understood. But frankly, sometimes uh, I I do for, uh, I draw for me, you know, and it's me the one who is enjoying. So Carlos, uh, origins uh, was was John after more than thirty years uh, explaining the backstory behind Judge Dredd and uh, Mega City One and the Justice Department after um, many, many, many years and many stories that, that hinted at certain aspects and things had changed over over time. Did did John um, uh, approach you and tell you that he was planning on on um, visiting this, this untold past story? Yes, we were talking a little bit before, before Han, and uh, yes, he was telling me, you know, about, um, about the origins of uh, Just Dread, not only Just Dread, but the, the Just System. Mm. And, and, and what, what were your feelings about that? Oh, I don't have any problem. You know, it's, uh, I like it. It was, uh, you know, in that way, the circle is, is getting it, it finished. You know, it's, um, uh, with origin, you can understand also many. Uh, uh, how the jet system was created and why. Mm. So it's a very important, it's a very important part of uh, of the story. But normally, just that always was based in uh, practically in the actual day. You know, day to day about what, what uh, that is happening. So, uh, but nobody knew exactly how the judges come out and why. And uh, I think that is a very good way to explain everything. Was it was it daunting having to to create uh, the judge's early look because obviously Dred's uniform and Dred's world have evolved over time. Um, what was your thought process behind choosing how those early judges looked? I took um, some of the ornamental things from Judge Dred, and uh, well, th- practically they look more. Those judges they look more uh, to the to the real police. And real police from today, you know, is um, th- they are not so much so ornate as as, as uh, with the with the uh, judges, and uh, they are not so much so ornate because in those times, I suppose maybe the people still were not crazy enough as later in the in the real t- life stories of years uh, then, so it was not necessary to notice them from far away. Who is yet? Uh, who is the law, or, or who is not? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's 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 interesting that John was able to bring together so many of the um, the different kind of plot ideas and 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 themes and and uh, mentions from the past together into one story because as, as as many of our fans and indeed us in the office do you know we we notice the inconsistencies that are built up over the years where 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 john and alan have have uh, thought of something and then dropped it or somebody else has introduced something so uh, for 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 john to be able to bring all that together in a really coherent uh narrative and a, a story that fits um the, i mean you know re- reading it now I, I i think that was really remarkable you yeah, well, yeah, but remember that uh, just that is John. Hmm. Uh, well, and I, I don't mean physically, you know, even if they <laughs> look, even if they look alike a little bit. <laughs> but uh, what I mean is the story of just that is John's story. Hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's everything is on his head, and uh, he is the, the the real creator of just that. You know, the, the of the story of just that. He can make everything. Uh, going smoothly, you know, and, and tying things that apparently they don't have any connection, and then he's able to tie because everything is inside his head. So it's um, 
uh, the, uh, the, just read the story is inside his head more than anyone else. You mm. know, it's his story. And uh, obviously, we've been talking about the apocalypse war previous to this. Um, let, let, let's kind of compare and contrast life for you back then and life for you uh, when you were doing Origins. Um, what were the differences in your art, uh, in the not only your artistic style but also the way that you work between what you were doing on the Apocalypse War and and when you came to do Origins? Uh, well, the artistic way is mm, is different. You know, it's um, different style totally even if i am always myself but it's in different way mm. and uh, also the main thing is that um, i was older too <laughs> so yes yeah, so you can see dread and the situations are not as uh, well i was older and also john is older too so mm. just that is a little bit more uh, compassive you know it's more you know, so savage as uh, it was before. You know, it's uh, uh, I don't know how to say it. more soft. <laughs> soft. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's always a very strange uh, word to apply in any way, shape, or form to uh, to judge dread. But I, 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 do, I do get your meaning. Yeah, he's now more compre more comprehensive than before. He more he understood more the people. Mm. He can. I don't say he can bend the law, but he can have another interpretation sometimes. Well, there, there is an, an element of compassion now. Um, if you look at the things that, that happened with the, uh, the the mutant laws that he brought in, he recognised that they were fundamentally unjust, whereas uh, uh, old-style dread wouldn't have ever countenanced even the suggestion that that might be the case. Yeah, well, remember that, for example, in the first story... Uh, even the one who, that was never published, he shot a guy just because he was stepping out from the pavement. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, or even if someone throw out a paper in the street, you know, he can be take uh, to the ISO cubes. Yeah. And even the ISO cubes, you know, because originally the first ones, it was life or death, nothing else. Mm. The ISO cubes, they start coming. Yeah, a little bit after, but um, so you know, everything has been softer with the with the years. You get more, yeah, maybe more soft, more comprehensive, <laughs> uh, more understanding to the to the people. Sure, it, it, it's it's. I find it incredible that uh, um, uh, the, the 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 term "judge dread" as uh, as entered the lexicon as as um, uh, you know a, 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 a metaphor for police brutality and and it's so often trotted out when you see those big lines of riot police with their with their visors down so you can barely see their faces and all, all the kit over them it, it it's i mean like so much in judge dread it was remarkably prescient and and forward thinking well it's because the the what happened with just Dredd is not everybody accused just Dredd of being a fascist and so on i always uh, say no you know, a fascist is bad man. A fascist is any vigilante uh, character. But just read, no, just read this. If the law says something, he just follow the law. That, uh, that, uh, this is also what happened with many of these uh, riot uh, policemen. Hmm. Mm, they follow whatever the superior say. If the, the superior say fire with this against these people, they just follow the, the order, nothing else. So uh, I don't think they are vicious by nature. Mm. If they are vicious, it's because someone in top are telling them to do that. Someone in top, uh, he can be telling that um, by voice or by laws. Mm. So the only way these people cannot be uh, aggressive is changing the laws. The laws. So, so um, as far as you're concerned, that that separates them from the fascists because the the, the fascists just do what they want. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a fascist is um, uh, Batman is a very typical uh, example of fascist. He's a vigilante. He take. He's not um, defending law and order. He's defending his own law. Okay. He's supposed to be just uh, punish the bad the bad people, but. Um, is not told by by any law to guarantee 
his right, you know, to do these kind of things. Mm. He's doing because he wanted. And I don't think it's too much difference in between uh, a bad man, bad man or, I don't know, a guy from the Ku Klux Klan burning a, 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 a black guy because for him, for the Ku Klux Klan guy, a black guy is, is, a, is a something bad also, you know? Now, um, in terms of uh, 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 your, your old style on um, the Apocalypse War, I presume that was just straightforward uh, pencil and, and pen and ink onto, uh, on, onto a Bristol board. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, how does that compare with what you do now? Is the process the same? Yeah, the process is, uh, practically is the same. You know, I, well, the, the only thing is I don't use Bristol board, but... <laughs> But it's, uh, it's the same. Also, now it's a smaller size. Mm. In those times, I was uh, I was working in something like an A2 plus, something like this. Uh, well, almost A2 uh, pages, because in that way, I can work faster. As uh, you know, you can do, you can be more sketchy. And when it was printed, you notice less the sketchiness. Right, okay. Yeah, and now it's in a smaller size, so it's better and more finished the, the artwork. But uh, practically the process is the same. I make pencil, ink, and paper, I scan, and then I put the coloring in with the computer. That is the only thing that has changed. Because <coughs> I, I remember especially your work on uh, uh, Necropolis, which is going to be collected in, in, in the collection further down the line. Um, uh, that that was uh, uh, kind of watercolor washes and, and marker pens and, and, and all sorts, wasn't it? Yeah, more, well, more than watercolors, they were inks. Right, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, and in, uh, coloring, you know, like Indian inks, but in color. Mm. And because the color, it was um, stronger. And I always love strong color, you know, as... Uh, as with watercolor, the color is more subdued, mm. soft. And um, but uh, then when I started, I started with the computer. Um, for me, it was in the year ninety six, I think. I think it was. I was also the first, maybe the first uh, British artist to work for comics to color the comics with a computer. Right. Okay. And uh, it was like a. It was like a toy. So you know, I really enjoy. I was doing crazy things. You can see some of the of the comics from that time, and um, the Tenth Planet. I think it was one of them, and uh, I don't know several of them. And uh, I was crazy with the with the coloring with the com com coloring with the computer, plus also the the workers in the printing. Also, mm, uh, they do not understand totally. Uh, the way I was coloring, and uh, well, sometimes <laughs> the final product is uh, is crazy. I, I I think that's uh, an element that a lot of people forget about comics is uh, it it's not just the work that the artist or the colorist does. The the printers then have to make sure that uh, um, the 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 right um, settings on their on their machines are correct, and that the the, the paper is uh, isn't going to make everything all uh, all mushy and brown. Yes, that is very, very important. And uh, and especially if you are working with the, the kind of paper from that time that it was like almost newspaper mm. paper. And uh, also uh, doing it with the computer, my settings in my computer, they were not exactly the same as the setting they got in their computer. Right. Uh, you must remember that it was the, the first uh, times, the first years, you know, in the with the with the this kind of thing so it took quite some time quite a long time several years until everything was uh, we can work together perfectly right <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, uh, you, you mentioned when we were talking about the uh, the apocalypse war uh, about um, the dynamic of a writer uh, writing down you know two armies meet um on uh, with thousands of soldiers meet you know meet on a on a windy plane or something like that um uh, and and you, you sort of say well why 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 can't you just write a story about one person in a desert because much of origins is set in the cursed earth which is uh, has that real wild west uh, desert feel uh, to it um with your background as a as a western artist it is is uh, is the cursed earth a location that uh, that appeals to you 
Yes, I really like it. Uh, you know, for example, I never like it very much doing it in, in clean city. You know, in a city from today, mm. I can, it's very difficult for me to do it. But um, when it's something like in the desert or the kind of cities, uh, something that is dirty, I don't know, maybe because I am a dirty artist, <laughs> dirty all <bubble> artist. <laughs> My my artwork, uh, if it's better, you know, than than um, I, I never been, you know, doing very clean lines. Mm. So mm -hmm. I really like it, you know, especially in, in deserts and, uh, as I say, you know, the kind towns or machinery that is not that is uh, is not a cleaning machinery. Mm. I really like that kind that kind of thing. I really enjoy it. Well, it, I mean, it's interesting you mention that because, of course, you, your your first ever pinup of of two thousand eighty, I think, really struck Pat Mill. Uh, not two thousand eighty, Mega City One really struck Pat Mills because the buildings looked so incredibly organic. You know, they 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 weren't the straight edges of somebody like Ron Smith. Um, uh, they weren't the clean lines of of, of, of other artists. There was a, a very much a feel of the the city as a kind of uh, almost like a plant in of itself that this this had grown over time. And and even you work on 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 Strontium Dog, all the all the uh, uh, the machines, the, the the cars, the hover bikes, the spaceships, they're, they're all rounded and and feel very uh, organic and real. Yes, well, it's because I always say. Told you before, I prefer to. I think I like to to draw something that is alive. Mm. You know that is very very important for to me. And uh, with the buildings in in, in Mega City, originally it's because the description I got from John is uh, Mega City. It was a, 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 a well a Mega City, a big city, growing very fast indeed. Mm. In Spain, we say well, it's growing like mushroom. <laughs> so. The idea was to make the buildings like mushrooms, you know, like just um, well, a part of the phallic sense <laughs> that many <laughs> people have <laughs> is uh, is like mushroom, you know, it's a round top, like going upwards. Yeah, and that was always my idea, you know, in in in, in that way. <laughs> I, I love the idea of Mega City One. Uh, uh, the, the look of Mega City One being based on on something that's both phallic and uh, born out of fungi—that's uh, <laughs> quite a mix. Yeah, well, uh, basically, I suppose it's because I, I hate to do straight lines. Mm. I think uh, in the old times, in one occasion, uh, Mike McMahon he was complaining because he said, "Oh, you cannot do a bloody straight line," you know. <laughs> <laughs> And it's true. I hate to do straight lines. <laughs> it's too clean for my taste. Well, um, with uh, with Origins, John uh, kind of sparked the, the the next phase of of Dred's development as a character because. Um, uh, it it, it uh, led into the Tour of Duty storylines, which were also going to be part of the Mega Collection, uh, and uh, uh, all the way through to to Dread being exiled to the Cursed Earth. Um, how do you feel as as the co-creator, seeing even after all this time the character continuing to grow and continuing to change? Uh, I see it uh, very well indeed. You know, it's, uh, for me, my characters, the characters I created, they are a little bit like um, you can say they are like my sons. Mm. You can say that. So each one has different uh, character, different personality. So. You cannot control the way it's going one over the other one. It's something that uh, you cannot control it. Mm. Even if sometimes you try to do one thing, uh, the character has to follow their own, their own, their own way. Okay. Yeah, that is the reason I suppose that, uh, for example, with that, even if it has been taken by so many artists, each one in totally different style, and each artist supporting uh, to the story something. Uh, it's always been thin. You know, it's, uh, uh, you cannot change him, mm. his, his, his character. So, so that character is the one who, that John created. And it, it's it's remarkable that, that um, when so many other comic book characters around the world have been have been rebooted and changed and and uh, other people taken over dread is still dread he's still the same 
man who pushed the button in the Apocalypse War, who's now riding out into the Cursed Earth to uh, uh, to find the, the body of Chief Judge Fargo? Well, uh, that is um, that is because of you. You know, it's, it's mm. so well done that uh, he can keep it uh, his him all the time. You know, it's not that um, a character that's changed uh, depending on the artist who takes it. No, it's, you know, it's him. Mm. I think that is due to, to young scripts. Now, you, you, you've you mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation about... Uh, um, a lot of people calling Judge Dredd a, a, a fascist, and, and that, that's usually the um, the term that people use. But you, you mentioned that, that actually you consider characters such as um, Batman to be to be more fascist because they're operating under their own rules. They're, they're using violence um, outside of the the framework of the law, and of course. Um, uh, Dread, uh, in the course of, uh, of, of the aftermath of Origins, uh, finds himself uh, on the outside of, uh, of, of, Meg- of Mega City One's Justice Department because the law that he fought for to allow mutants into into Mega City One has has failed. Um, I mean, that's that's a remarkable thing to do to to to, to have a character fight for justice and for it to blow up in his face. Uh, yeah, but you know it's, that is real. That is the, the it, it, that is something that it could it can happen perfectly. Mm. So you know it's, it's, in, it's not a fiction a fiction uh, thing that superimposed on the character. It's something that uh, has been developing over the years into that way. So it doesn't seem strange that you know it's, it's been a natural development for him. And uh, just to, to, to turn to you for for, for a second um, and, and a bit of real life, because uh, I, I came and visited you in Spain uh, a number of years ago to to chat for an interview for the for, for the magazine, and shortly after that, you um, uh, you unfortunately had a, a, a bout of ill health um, with, uh, with with your lungs. Do you, you want to just tell us a bit about that and and how that affected your your perception of your of your work and and uh, and, and and the future of uh, of uh, your involvement with Dread. Uh, no, I don't think I don't think it affect me at all. You know, it was for me it was an event that has not well. It was important in that in that moment, mm. but now it's something like four years since. Uh, uh, well, I got diagnosed diagnosticated with a lung cancer, and. Uh, in the stage three, which it was very, very dangerous, but I was lucky enough to find to be, to find that right in time. Mm. So I took away one lung, and uh, I still can survive. So you know, it's in, I don't even think about that. I feel perfect. The only thing is every six months I have to go to do my my test to see that everything is okay. Mm. But. Um, it, it will not affect me at all. You know, it's, uh, I got, the only thing maybe affect me <clears throat> is that I'm more grateful than ever to all the to the fans. Mm. You know, the response from the, the from the fans in the moment it was made public, it was fantastic. You know, it's, um, and ever ever since then, I appreciate more the, all the fans than than ever before. You know, that was a turning point for me. Uh, with the fans, mm. whatever I can do for a fan, I never turn turn him down. Or I, you know, even now every time I go to England to any convention, I do whatever I can for the for, for the British fans. You know, I feel uh, it was very very touching. You know that um, I feel fantastic. You know, it was a fantastic rush. Mm. Good, good, and um, of course you're uh, you're one of the special guests at the San Diego Comic Con this year. Yes, I was in, I've been invited, and uh, well, I'll be there. I've never been in San Diego before. I always consider it was a bit too far away, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, well, I'll be this year, and I'll be in the I suppose I'll be in the in the stand of uh, 2018 signing. So, um, 
just talking about origins again um you you mentioned that uh, that you felt that the circle had had been completed because you you you'd created the character and you'd come back and you you'd told his his origin story is there a a, a story that uh you would you would like to tell about dread and his world uh no not particularly i think <laughs> you know whatever the story is is that on i i like it you know it's uh, so no i don't have any any particular any any particular um, one i you know whatever john write i'll be, I'll be very happy as i say you know it's, uh, we got uh, very well together so I'd be happy with whatever he write. Excellent, and 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 long may it continue. So it's been another absolutely packed uh, thrill cast for you, uh, this week. And, uh, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to Carlos Esquera for joining us, uh, for the last two episodes. Carlos, thank you so much indeed for, for, for sparing us the time to, uh, to chat ev- uh, to everybody. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. And I hope to see you in 2008.